Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's going to be an exciting couple of days, couple of half days as we celebrate the, the ACES legacy. Uh, and it's a legacy that literally hundreds of people have contributed to over the last uh, decade and a bit, uh, decade and a half. It's been a, a long time uh, in the Megan, but it's been quite uh, an exciting journey. A uh, special thanks to our advisory board members, some of which are with us today. Uh, for their uh, counsel and guidance uh, over those years uh, and their input uh, into our success. Uh, and a thank you to the Deputy Vice Chancellors of the uh, respective organisations that, that make up ACES and for their role in the operations group uh, over the years. So over the next few days, we're, we're going to celebrate advances in, in knowledge and discovery, uh, but also advances in pathways to transfer that, that knowledge. Uh, and as all of you know, we've been very fortunate to create quite unique uh, infrastructure uh, along this journey for both the fundamental research and for our translational activities, uh, and uh, to be fortunate to be involved in the development of innovative uh, training programs from which we have all benefited from, not just our uh, PhD students and our early career researchers, but I think we've all learned from each other uh, through the development of those uh, training programs. So we have been very privileged through uh, this uh, quantum of ARC funding uh, to be given the responsibility uh, to take on very fundamental and challenging uh, research endeavors uh, and along that journey to plot how we can translate that knowledge uh, into real outcomes for the, the people that we're working with and the people that we're working for. So I think we've all learned that we're part of that, that chain, that human chain uh, that takes ideas through to the practical outcomes uh, we've often discussed that no one individual uh, traverses that whole chain, but, be, but we're all uh, a critical link within it, uh, acquiring knowledge uh, from, from each other, uh, building on that knowledge and then handing that knowledge on in a way that it can be disseminated and utilised uh, by those who need to use it. So we do go back a long way. We started pretty small. In fact, we started nano and it was all about understanding the impact of nanostructure uh, on the performance of materials, whether that be uh, physical, chemical, biological, or electrical. Uh, and then we built on that uh, body of knowledge uh, to, to move forward into developing fabrication and assembly strategies that could utilize uh, those amazing properties, and particularly in the areas of, of, of energy uh, and in health. Uh, so we built up a lot of new technologies over that time uh, and utilized them, particularly in areas like energy conversion and storage. Uh, electrofluidics and diagnostics, uh, our soft robotics program, and of course, our medical technologies program in synthetic uh, biosystems. And, and throughout that journey, we've always had an eye to translation. So uh, we have developed our materials processing methods to be scalable. Uh, we've developed characterization methods that enable us uh, to interrogate uh, without necessarily decimating the structures that we're looking at. And, and those innovative fabrication strategies to put uh, all of those structures together. And of course, all of this has been done in close collaboration with our colleagues in ethics, policy and public engagement, who have really helped us to understand the non-technical issues uh, that are critical to effective translation. Uh, and those collaborations are uh, particularly special, I think, in the way that they've developed uh, over the, the course of ESSES and will continue uh, to develop uh, in years to come. So I hope you enjoy uh, the sessions today and tomorrow. Uh, it really is a, a celebration of what some amazing individuals have been able to achieve uh, by working together as part of a, a very uh, effective team. Uh, and you're gonna hear lots of stories, I'm sure, about uh, all of those advances, both te techno technological training, uh, and also uh, some of the, the other advances in terms of translation that have really been made possible because of us all uh, being able to work together. So I'm going to chair the first session, but uh, I've got Sam, my henchman, on the, on the clock, uh, and he'll be keeping an eye on you guys. And uh, I, I really don't want to have to resort to the gong, uh, but if I do have to, uh, I, I will be gonging people out at the appropriate time, and, uh, and Sam will be turning you off. Uh, so no, it's, it's a great... Thank you everybody for coming along today. Thank you to the presenters for preparing uh, to engage in what's going to be a really exciting uh, session today and tomorrow. Uh, and without any further ado, and uh, 
hopefully right on time, I'm going to introduce Ali Jalali from the University of New South Wales and, and ask Ali to kick off our program this afternoon. So welcome again and thank you, Ali. Thanks again, Gordon, uh, uh, to give me this opportunity uh, to present in ACES Legacy and also all the opportunities that I've given and worked with those people at ACES and still been working. Uh, currently, I am ARC DECRA Fellow at University of New South Wales, but I started my journey and my with my PhD in Gordon's group. So I joined uh, ACES IPRI. On that time, I think it was not ACES yet, at 2008, and I did my PhD with Gordon. These are my legends. These are people who helped me in that journey. So at 2008, I worked with Gordon for my PhD. The PhD was around fiber spinning. I've started uh, spinning fibers from conducting polymers and then into graphene until around 2013 that I've graduated. And then I've continued one year as a postdoc and worked with uh, David on a CRC polymer pr project and then Peter Innes on SMR automotive project. After that, I received ACES fellowship for graphene development. So most of the development that I had in my career came from uh, that, that period that I was closely working with Gordon and David. And also I had opportunity to work with uh, different nodes of ACES and work with uh, many people across different nodes because graphene was on that time very central to many projects. Most of the project that I had was graphene development, for example, functionalized graphene that we know as a fun funky graphene and a graphene fiber microelectrode that now we know as a suit root. Uh, but most of the development was on processing then I got a vice chancellor fellowship and left ACES to RMIT. But soon after that, I joined another nodes of ACES and I joined um, Docs Group in Monash as a visiting fellow. Uh, that was a turning point uh, that was really generous and very, very supportive. Uh, I, 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 on that time, I was very good on processing, but not really on a particular application. That, where I could learn a new application, which was nitrogen reduction to ammonia. And after that, I built all of my career based on that. Uh, with Doc, I wrote a DECRA and I got that at Monash, but because of family issue, I had to leave uh, Melbourne and come to Sydney. And now I'm doing my DECRA at UNSW, but very closely still work with uh, ACES peoples. So I put some pictures from my time at uh, ACES. The one on top uh, left hand side, it's when I started my PhD. I was very young, happy, thin. And there is a picture of people that I did my studies together. And that's, you can see, a celebration of 21st year birthday of IPRI. Also, the one that I'm in suit is when I graduated. Still, I would think I could have suit. And then Phyllis Mark, uh, my legend. Uh, hopefully, some sometimes in near future he can dethrone Gordon. David, uh, very very supportive. I learned a lot from him. And Cameron Willow, you can see there. It's when we graduated. And the picture on top right hand side is the sad picture that is my last day at IPRI when I was cleaning my uh, stuff. But after that, I came back and worked there a lot more, but that was my official working day at IPRI, which was around 2017. So uh, over my PhD and a little bit first year of my postdoc, we learned that if we synthesize graphene oxide with very, very large sheet, they form liquid crystal. And then because of that, you can process them with the way that you can process polymers. Uh, we made some fiber, for example, from them. The fibers were conducting and high surface area. So we could use them as the electrode in the application that surface area was important. Uh, over my uh, ACES fellowship, 
we expand those processing to more scalable processes like roll-to-roll -roll coating, spray coating, inkjet printing, 3D printing. And we use them in several applications that I put one example here, which was graphene-based uh, microelectrode or sutrut. The story for this development was a nice one. Uh, Electrodes for recording are mostly based on metals that they are rigid and they don't have high surface area. Uh, people try to modify them by coating them with high surface area conducting materials, but there are some issues, for example, delamination. In one of meeting that I had with Gordon, we said if we do opposite, instead of coating a soft material with a rigid, on a rigid material, why, how, if we can do opposite, so we get a soft material, high surface area material and coat that with high conducting metals, which was uh, platinum. Can we solve that problem? So we did that. So with graphene, we could have high surface area and with uh, platinum coating, we could have high uh, charge collection property because uh, platinum is a good conductor. So that was the birth of Sutrut. Uh, after that, I joined Doc's group. We work on nitrogen reduction. So the idea was to get nitrogen and then electrochemically convert that to ammonia, which was very, very difficult. And we started to think on intermediary pathways that instead of directly converting nitrogen to ammonia, we convert nitrogen to a more reactive species, then convert that reactive species to ammonia. When I left the group, I, I started to work on Knox intermediary. I uh, collaborated with uh, some people at UNSW and Sydney Uni that we could get plasma to convert air and nitro uh, air and water to Knox in an energy efficient way, and also a way that is compatible with renewable energy. Then easily using electrochemistry converted NOx to ammonia. So I did lots of research in this uh, area. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on those reactor design. So the reactors are basically pl non-thermal plasma bubblers in water. There is a video here that shows a video of our reactor. In thermal plasma is very energy intensive, but non-thermal plasma, you only have high energy electron that can localize, do some reaction for you. And, and the way that we uh, created the reactors was to make a plasma inside water bubble, and then we break down nitrogen and oxygen, and in the interface between water, they react together and then form NOx. And with electrochemistry, we could convert that NOx to ammonia. Uh, lots of lots of work on how to design the reactors, because plasma we can have a glow discharge, or we can have a spark discharge, or we can combine them to uh, get better energy efficiency. There is a video of one of the larger scale um, uh, reactor that we have. You can see that the plasma discharge goes to water and then make NOx. We try to optimize the energy efficiency. And then if you have that in uh, electrochemistry cell, in one side, you can make NOx. In the other side, you can convert it to ammonia. You can also work on the catalyst that can do that reaction efficiently. We did a lot in that space. Also, we tried to scale that up with the way that we have a large scale plasma pro uh, produced NOx and then direct it to electrolyzer to make ammonia. Uh, on the time that I created this graph, which was a year ago, uh, from energy side and rate side, we've been a lot, a lot better than most people. Uh, the field is very fast moving. Perhaps uh, people did a lot better now, but still we are working on that. So uh, with those ammonia work, I worked very closely with Doug's group, get lots of help from him. Uh, and also uh, with Peter Innes, because we want to do some work on electrode design using 3D printing, which are suitable for a NOx reduction. Uh, in the end, I would like to thank Gordon, who gave opportunity to me to do my PhD and then postdocs and fellowship in ACES, David, Peter, Doug, and in the end, Powell, who never, never left me any 
and never, never left any question unanswered for me and massive support in the lab. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks all the ACES. I'm ready to take any question. Thanks, Ali. That was brilliant. Uh, let, let me kick it off and let me just encourage people uh, to put questions uh, in, into the chat. Um, so Ali, you mentioned scalability in terms of the, the plasma. That, that's really fascinating. And, and I noticed that they are separated from the electrochemical cell. I mean, is there any advantage in trying to combine them or is practically that's just too difficult? Oh, well, when, when I started to work on NOx, I was aiming mostly NOx as a contaminant or waste NOx. But we realized that if we find a way to make that NOx using renewable energy, that is an advantage because most of the renewable energies are like areas that they are not people or they are on and off, on and off. You, they are not always on. So we try to design reactors that can make ammon, uh, make NOx. Then we can store that and then convert that to ammonia whenever you want. In terms of the scalability. Uh, those reactors are modular. I had a picture that the one that was in the picture is two liters reactor, and you can have parallel lots of those that are working parallel. And each reactor is around uh, 10 watt. Okay. So, so you don't need to make just a hundred or thousand a kilowatt of reactor. You can have lots of modular parallel working together, and then make that NOx. And and in, in a fairly good concentration and, and good energy efficiency. Still, we are very off uh, if we want to compare it to Haber Bosch. But if we aim only renewable energy, which is cheap, and if we increase the energy efficiency by tenfold, we are better than Haber Bosch. Then. Okay, great. Got a question there from uh, from Robert. Uh, um, do you think that problems with the nitrogen cycle will soon make nit nitrogen fixation as important as carbon dioxide reduction? Uh, so, you know, so is the nitrogen uh, problem, is this the next sort of global crisis is what Robert's asking? Oh, well, uh, it, it, it's difficult to answer because we don't want to replace or, or we don't want to choose. Those are different alternatives that we work. Nitrogen uh, fixation is valuable if we can do that decentralized because it's heavily been used as a fertilizer. So if we, if we, can, if we can use those uh, nitrogen reduction to produce uh, on-site fertilizer, it's valuable. Also nitrogen, a recent, uh, Ammonia recently been considered as an energy vector or hydrogen carrier because it's going to store hydrogen more than liquid hydrogen. So that, that's value to that. But honestly, I started my work with CO2 reduction and they share huge amount of similarities. And I always take advantage of those similarities to design my work. For example, copper been used mostly for CO2 reduction and I adopted that because Carbon oxide is similar to nitrogen oxide. Okay, great. Look, there's no other questions in the chat at the moment, Ali. But if anybody thinks of anything, drop it into the chat still. I'm sure that uh, Ali will respond, or uh, I'm sure you've got his email where you can uh, correspond with him directly. So again, on behalf of everyone, Ali, thanks for a great it's talk awesome. and kicking us off today. Brilliant stuff, mate. And, uh, all the best and we'll, we'll move on uh, to our next presenter uh, and our next presenter is uh, Lilith from Swinburne University and I won't waste any time with uh, long introductions but just hand straight over to Lilith to tell us all about her uh, very exciting work thank you uh, hello everyone um, the title of my presentation today is advanced drug delivery structures um, but I actually want to start by telling you a bit of uh, how did I became a part of ACES. And basically, I studied uh, physics engineering back in Mexico, and I always wanted to be an astrophysicist. Um, so I did all the courses in, um, in astrophysics. Uh, I did a winter school in a different university. Um, I even went for a semester exchange in, uh, in a different country. And that was a lot of fun, but I realized it wasn't really my, um, my true calling. So 
Um, after that, I decided to do something slightly different. So I tried to go to a summer school on photonics and bioelectronics um, in the north of Mexico. And really, everything was very exciting. But what really caught my attention was the bio part of, of this school. So uh, with that, then I came back to the uni and I started to do uh, an honors, honors project in um, developing a tumor model for hyperthermia using uh, nanoparticles and hydrogels and that went uh, pretty well um, we end up uh, publishing some of those that work and we also presented in a couple of conferences so from that i was very excited on the biomedical field and i decided to go to um, to europe to Cairo Leuven university to do my master in biomedical engineering and uh, the program was pretty exciting. It actually included um, some lab visits, uh, some short projects in a couple of universities in Europe. So I went to France and to Poland. And then I ended up doing um, my master thesis um, in a tissue engineering laboratory run by Professor uh, Frank Lutin. And the topic was on the optimization of bioactive compounds for bone regeneration. And the thesis was basically looking at um, utilizing um, drugs to drive specific cellular fates. And I was pretty excited um, about that and about the results. So I really wanted to continue on something um, that would relate uh, to drug delivery. So I started looking for PhD positions and I found a PhD position at Swinburne University. And it was, well, my principal supervisor was uh, Professor Simon Moulton. This was an ACES founded position. And so I was a part of ACES from 2016 to uh, December, 2019. And the title of the um, advertised position was Advanced Job Delivery Structures, which is the title of my presentation as well today. Um, so the overall aim of the PhD back in June 2016 was to develop novel uh, delivery systems for drug or bioactive agents to provide um, desired release rates and basically to study or manipulate some physiological events. So it was very general. Um, so I decided to work with um, Two different polymers so one alginate you know uh, pretty well is um, a hydrophilic polymer and um, combined with that with a hydropoly uh, hydrophobic polymer which is polycaptrolactone and by creating um, these uh, pcl templates that then we will fill with alginate we aim it to control uh, the release profile of certain molecules and it did it did happen that way and uh, we investigated um, a couple of molecules of different molecular weight, and we published some of this work in December 2018. And then after forming these uh, microparticles, we then um, investigated what would happen if we um, embedded these microparticles within uh, gelma hydrogels. So what we call uh, secondary encapsulation. And we um, utilized a, a hydrogel, which was a high metacrylated hydrogel, and compared that against a low metacrylated hydrogel. Um, we did the characterization of this, and we also were looking at the change in release profiles. And what we observed it was that um, the release profiles was actually a very, very slow release profile um, up to 30 days. So um, we published this work in April 2019 in Soft Matter. And then we actually started a collaboration with uh, the cartilage regeneration team. Um, so this team were looking at uh, using, well, are looking <laughs> still at using um, a handheld uh, device, which will uh, 3D print um, hydrogels and uh, stem cells directly into the cartilage defects to um, uh, to provide a treatment for osteoarthritis. So um, then 
the idea was for me to integrate um, growth factors within my microparticles and then integrate that within their system in order to encourage the cells to become a cartilage tissue. So basically the objective was to, um, to drive chondrogenesis by delivering uh, growth factors. So I use um, my microparticles to encapsulate TG beta 3 and BMP6. And we mixed that with uh, gelma and hyaluronic acid at the time. And we printed that and then we waited for uh, 21 days to see if we could have some differentiation, but that actually didn't happen. So what it happened is that uh, thanks to that experiment, we were able to identify um, a lot of the limitations that the system had. So basically um, the microparticles were slightly too big um, to fit within the scaffold size that we were aiming. Um, also the loading, it wasn't, it wasn't the best. So basically if we wanted to load more profactors, we needed to increase the, um, the amount of particles at, that was not, uh, not really possible. So um, we end up with the conclusion that really making smaller spheres and increasing the growth factor loading was, was the way to, um, to tackle this issue. And at the same time, I also became obsessed with growth factor delivery and we published this 50-page uh, review in Journal of Control Release in uh, 2019. And the other thing that happened is that I convinced my supervisor to buy this uh, microencapsulation system, which uh, is a, it's produced by Dolomai in UK. And basically what it does is um, allow the control um, formation of particles by using microfluidics. And uh, we work a lot with this system. Um, we did a lot of characterization on the encapsulation of the growth factors. We show that the growth factors were still into, um, into the integra integral form. So basically they were still uh, active after the encapsulation and in the release. And we publish uh, all this characterization in the Journal of uh, Color Interface Science. We also got an inside uh, journal cover and we publish also a method in uh, methods 10. So um, by that time, my PhD was um, coming to an end, basically. But um, all, all the knowledge that we have acquired uh, to that, it, it really continued to um, to be used during my postdoc project. So um, an example of it, and one of my current uh, projects as postdoc is to utilize in uh, microparticles prepared as well with the with the same system, but this time looking at uh, PLGA microparticles. And those particles are encapsulating chemotherapeutics that then are um, placed within implants to be used in um, pancreatic uh, tumor applications. So this is some work in collaboration with Ilawara Health and Medical Research Institute and also University of Wollongong. So we're currently running, uh, currently running some in vitro testing of this work. So I'm very excited to see um, how that um, will result. Um, derived from, uh, from the PhD, we also uh, started a project in collaboration with uh, Dr. Serena Duki from University of Melbourne. And this project is all about creating an injectable formulation to be able to deliver uh, chemotherapeutics for um, a post-resectional stage of osteosarcoma. So after the bone cancer has been removed, uh, we will uh, potentially provide this uh, chemotherapeutic in order to um, eliminate any uh, cancerous cells that have been potentially left behind. And we've done some uh, in vitro work um, of this recently, and we saw some promise um, using this strategy. And derived as well from, uh, from this is um, a project that is in uh, collaboration with the Burnett Institute and that is uh, being carried by um, PhD student Sarin Ahmadi. So Sarin is a PhD student that is supervised by Simon, uh, Professor Simon Moulton, and I'm uh, co-supervising 
and she's looking into creating microparticles that could contain um, a formulation to treat bacterial vaginosis. And also um, derived from, from this work, we are working on um, a, as, a, as part of a ACH square grant uh, on a coating uh, made of hydrogels also for this uh, treatment. Uh, so this is some uh, work in progress. Um, it's, it's an ongoing progress. Um, and last but not least, I'm also uh, continuing working on the cartilage regeneration project. So based on all the, um, really all the deep understanding that we got from, uh, from the growth factors during the PhD and also from the release profiles and the cellular behavior, we're now working on a strategy that look at the functionalization of um, some molecules that are able to, um, to entrap the two growth factors and they're also able to um, chemically uh, bind to gelma. And we recently done some, um, some in vitro testing, um, testing two formulations of, of this functionalization. And for the first time, we were actually able to see some, um, some collagen, collagen production. Uh, here you can see it in, in blue. Um, some collagen production without the need of any, um, any growth factors in the media, so any chondrogenic media. So this is basically the first time we see that. So we are very excited about this work and hopefully we can get to publish that uh, very soon. And there is a couple of other um, ACES outcomes or outcomes that came out of um, my time in ACES, besides obviously my current projects. Um, I got awarded an ANF uh, travel grant, so I went two weeks to the University of Wollongong to do some 3D printing using alginate and polycapturlactone. Um, we also got uh, two, um, two uh, research endowment fund grants um, for 20,000 each, so 40 in total. And I also got my certificate in innovation and entrepreneurship. And of course, um, attended all the ACES conferences, did some presentations, posters, and um, we also did some uh, interviews and podcasts uh, together with the ACES communication team. Um, it was a very, uh, very good time for me. Uh, I mean, it feels like it was just yesterday. Um, I got a lot of uh, good friendship, good networking, good collaborations, and of course, a lot of uh, fun times. Um, so I just want to thank you everyone for all the support and um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lilith. Uh, well, we've got time for a couple of uh, quick uh, questions, but first of all, let me thank you for the presentation and uh, it really is a great example of uh, multidiscipline work, working with others and then building on that to create uh, new opportunities. Uh, both of the questions in the chat relate to the, the, the loading issue um, uh, for the growth factor. Uh, and one is just aimed at uh, what, what is the highest concentration you can achieve? And, and maybe more importantly, is the loading sufficient to instigate regeneration or to influence cell behavior? Uh, yes, so that's an excellent question. Um, so, during the first time that we were investigating this, definitely the loading was not enough to trigger differentiation. We were way below the loading. Um, now with this new strategy, we started to see some differentiation. Perhaps we still need to um, boost a bit on the loading, but there is still a bit of unknown of what's the real dosage that these cells require. Um, we did some studies recently, and we observed that the protocols for differentiation, so uh, per se, uh, adding growth factors to the media, they are way above the uh, cellular requirements. So it's always provided in excess. So um, we still need to um, find out what's really the precise amount that the cells actually consume. So that's, yeah, that's something super exciting that's coming up next. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, we sort of, we better keep moving to stay on time. There's a Another question in the chat there for you, Lilith, if you would like to have a look at that. 
and, yeah. and answer it and um, on uh, online. Uh, and if anyone's got any other questions, please uh, com keep communicating uh, with, with Lilith. But, but thanks for a great presentation, Lilith, uh, an excellent example uh, of what you've been able to achieve, great story of what you've been able to achieve and continue to achieve. So well done, great stuff, and thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on to our next uh, presentation, Katrina Hutchinson uh, from Sydney University. Uh, and, and you'll notice that the, 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 the topics uh, are quite varied uh, and, and within the, the presentations. And, and that's because the, the activities of ACES have been quite varied, but uh, still with a common vision, and that is to take fundamental science into real applications. So I'll, I'll hand over to Katrina. Uh, yeah, so I thought what I would do is um, I've been working with the EPI team in ACES or I was uh, uh, a research fellow at ACES for a while and then an associate investigator. So I give you a little bit of background about my involvement with ACES. And then I thought um, I try to synthesize some of the take homes from some of the main themes that I was um, that have come out of the ACES related research that I've been doing. So hence the title of the talk is balancing clinical and commercial goals in medical device innovation and ethical challenge because that seemed to be a kind of theme that um, brought together some of the um, topics across a number of different uh, papers and projects that I've done in this time. So um, from 2015 to 2016 I came to Monash University and uh, worked as an uh, ACES research fellow with um, Professor Robert Sparrow and um, the wider EPI team um, led by also Sue Dodds and um, Linda Hancock as the CIs. Uh, my focus in this period with Rob was on the ethical issues associated with the maintenance of artificial organs. Um, and we did some uh, papers and research and presentations together on that. And when I left ACES for a different um, post postdoc um, in 2016, I remained on as an associate investigator. And since then, I've had further collaborations with Rob Sparrow, Mary Walker, Eliza Goddard, Mark Howard, Justin Burke, Alex Harris, Jane Nielsen, and perhaps others. Um, across, uh, I guess, three broad topics. So looking at ethical issues in the design of devices and new medical technologies. I've done research on gender bias and implant in implant design and use. And this, um, I guess, drew together some topics that I'd been interested in while I was um, at ACES with um, the postdoc that I was doing at the time, which was on um, gender biases in surgery affecting patients and surgeons. And um, I've also done a number of, a bit of research on device industry representative roles in clinical care. So once um, medical technology is commercialized, uh, the employees of manufacturers, what are their roles and what kinds of ethical considerations do those throw up? And just in the last couple of years, I'm um, CI on an ARC discovery project called Support or Sales Medical Device Representatives in Australian Hospitals, which is um, led by Jane Johnson at Macquarie University and um, with other collaborators from Macquarie and Adelaide universities. And I've got a DECRA project on gender biases in surgery, which is a little bit less related to ACEs in that it focuses on um, surgical careers rather than uh, I guess, medical technologies. So during that time working on those different topics, I just thought I'd highlight a few themes that I think potentially um, bring together some of the research that I've done um, often in collaboration with others and potentially of interest um, to people in ACEs who are working on medical technologies for commercial applications. Uh, I focus on devices because that's where I've done most of my work, but I think some of these insights would potentially apply to other kinds of medical technologies too. Um, so first of all, uh, there were some themes that arise at the stage of the design of medical devices. So um, often people who are working on new devices, they might be um, clinicians, or they might be biomedical engineers, or they might even be um, laboratory scientists, or even engineers that don't have kind of biomedical background, could be working on um, input into tools and things. Uh, and some of these people have more connection with patients and potential end users than others. And I think that can affect the way that the um, products that are being developed are imagined for a potential future um, you know, end users. 
uh, and particularly how they might operate in different kinds of bodies or in different sorts of patient groups. So one example that, I, um, that I've come across in the research is where um, clinical work is funded by something like um, the US military DARPA or something like this. There's a kind of instinct to imagine that the end user patient group might be, um, you know, if it's for an arm prosthesis or something might be um, injured military personnel. But in fact, once that product's developed, it might also be used by a whole lot of people who've been born, say, with congenital limb difference or something like this. So the way that you imagine who end users are going to be can be limited by where the funds have come from, what the kind of name of the project is, um, your own personal experiences, and also um, things like gender stereotypes or um, other kinds of um, stereotypes. So I've just put this image on the slide to quickly illustrate this. This shows um, Fatima Al Ali, um, a woman from the United Arab Emirates, training in ice hockey with the Washington Capitals in the United States. And I think this is a really nice image to capture how people's stereotypes and expectations can be um, flawed. I suppose um, we've got someone from a country where ice hockey wouldn't be um, a traditional sport um, because of the climate. Um, a woman in a sport that's traditionally dominated by men, but playing at the highest and most elite level. So if you were a clinician or a device designer designing something like, um, I guess, uh, devices used in sports medicine, you wouldn't necessarily imagine this person as the end user for your device, but they may well be. And I think this is um, these sorts of considerations can interestingly be in tension with um, maximally profitable sort of models where you might say, I just want to design one thing that fits as many people as possible. And it might be a kind of disincentive for you to do research that discovers that it works better in some groups than others, because then you'd have to, I suppose, design something, you know, design several different things that would um, meet these different needs. Um, this can also be quite interestingly contrasted with trends in personalised medicine and some of the collaborations led by um, Mary Walker that I've been involved in for ACES have looked at much more personalised um, medicine types applications of medical technology. And of course, these don't have this challenge of trying to be one thing for everybody. In fact, they can be very um, specific and individualised um, and that can throw up different types of challenges. Um, a lot of my research is focused on gender biases, so where you assume that particular devices are going to be more likely used by men or women, or just if your patient groups that you test them on, um, uh, women or men um, are disproportionately represented, you may not discover um, if there are gender differences in the effectiveness of the technology. Um, so the stereotypes can be about sort of social identities, but they can also be about um, indications. So the example of the um, amputees uh, who've um, lost a limb during uh, military um, versus someone with congenital limb difference, I think is an interesting um, example of where the needs and expectations of the end user might be quite different. So you've got kind of two different patient groups um, that you may or may not take into consideration in design. And then there's also considerations about what's going to happen to the device once it's been implanted. So designing a device that works or works during a kind of initial evaluation period, which might be just months or um, years, but not very many, is quite different to something, for example, um, Rob Sparrow and I did some work on pacemakers at the start of my time with ACEs that has to last in the um, patient for the rest of their life. And if the device isn't long lasting or isn't repairable, that can obviously give rise to significant ethical problems, especially if you're imagining, you know, you you know, a company has intentionally designed something to have kind of um, uh, built in obsolescence or something. So um, another area is the device evaluation and translation into clinical practice. So I've got, you won't probably be able to read it in this size, but there's a little flow chart for deciding which devices might need a randomized control trial as opposed to other forms of device evaluation that comes from a paper I worked on with collaborators from Oxford um, and Australia. Um, there is questions about which patient groups devices are evaluated in. Um, there are questions about justice and equity. So for example, is your new device going to change the, um, whether or not wealthy or less wealthy people can access the care 
um, or is it going to, for example, centralise um, care? So one project that I did on surgical robots suggested that um, robotic surgeries require kind of the large upfront investment and high volume. So they tend to centralise where particular surgeries happen because they then happen at the hospitals that can afford to have the robot and provide all of the infrastructure required for that. Um, questions about need for registries to capture data about different patient groups or um, comorbidities that may not be, a, be feasible to capture in um, initial evaluations. Um, also the kind of broader questions about what counts as a risk and benefit. So there can be a tendency to kind of focus in on biological um, or physical um, outcomes, surgery, you know, what the surgeon sees when they um, suture up the wound or even in personalised medicine, what the biological parameters are and um, not think about that in the broader context of the person's quality of life. For example, does this person have to travel? How is it going to impact on their caring responsibilities and so forth? And what are their preferences? Um, there can be changes when you go from a brand new prototype device to something that's implemented in wide clinical practice for the way that it's implanted, follow up, maintenance, because when you're in a kind of early stages of developing a prototype, there's lots of interactions between the group who've developed the new um, device and um, patients. Whereas once it's implemented into clinical practice more broadly, this isn't the case anymore. So there needs to be a different model for that. And um, also learning curves as more people start to use something new. Um, how, what is the learning curve like? How safe is it? And what are the training processes? And one of the questions here is how involved is um, industry? in these training processes. And the final set of things is use in clinical practice. So once something is established, there are a further set of ethical questions about how clinicians decide um, whether this device is required and which particular device they choose if there are a number of options. And again, there's the really important um, considering individual contexts or needs of patients, avoiding stereotypes, and also avoiding risks of conflicts of interest. Sometimes clinicians will have been involved in the development of devices themselves, or they'll be kind of um, thought leaders or something for um, new technology. So this is um, posing a risk of conflicts of interest in the selection of devices or whether or not a patient even needs one. There's also um, questions about the role of industry employees or manufacturer employees in providing um, treatment and also um, involved in decision making. So for example, with a lot of cardiac devices, the industry employed um, technicians might be involved in um, providing and also helping interpret information from the pacemaker programmers or the cardiac device programmers. Um, and there are a lot of other areas of um, surgical and clinical care where industry employees do provide this kind of technical slash treatment sort of um, assistance and in operating rooms there's a lot of evidence of um, device company reps potentially um, contributing to decision making around how to use their devices and when to use them and so forth especially especially where it's new um, but even where it's um, established but not often used by the particular surgeon. Um, so that's an area that uh, some of our current ARC um, discovery project looks at and also just a very recent collaboration with Mark Howard from the EPI team on how knowledge is shared um, between industry professionals and I guess hospital employees in contexts like operating rooms and whether that has the potential to um, I guess create forms of conflicts of interest and then the importance of continued collection of real world data while things are um, once things are in established use to ensure that kind of rare um, or long-term side effects are picked up. So there's some of the main themes that have emerged from my research. And I've just got a list of some of the sort of um, ACEs related publications that I've been involved in that I've drawn on in just summarizing that material. Thanks. Great, thanks, uh, Christina. That, that's brilliant, uh, great insights into uh, quite a number of topics uh, that you've been involved with. and. Uh, obviously great evidence again of, of collaboration. Um, I've just got probably time for one question and then we'll let you do the rest uh, on, online. And this is from Holly. In terms of prosthesis design, would the aim be always to have the end user involved at the design phase or is that not realistic? Uh, let's just focus on that one and you can maybe answer the other bits and, and the other questions online, please. 
Yeah, thanks, Holly. Um, look, I, I'm perhaps not the best member of the EPI team to answer the questions about prosthetics because I know that Mary Walker and Eliza Goddard and people have done a lot of work um, with the soft robotics people on this. But look, obviously, um, there are pr practical um, considerations and uh, in, in involving end users, but I think you always, always should maximise the um, interaction with end users, even from the earliest stages, because the sorts of insights that you get from people who will be using it um, can be uh, surprising, I think. And also, I mean, there was a whole project that I did a case study on with DARPA with their arm, uh, their prosthetic arms that they'd been developing, where they did involve end users, but they seemed to kind of interpret the end user feedback about the models that they'd been developing kind of through the lens of their own priorities about what they wanted to do so when people said you know the arm is too heavy or something like this they said well you know what we noticed when we got people to use them for a while was their you know shoulders got stronger um, so i think there are these interesting questions about it's not just about involving end users but about really listening and and um, taking note of what their priorities are and what they're saying and not always hearing that through the framework that you're already working with. Um, and one other thing I'd say is it's, if you have just one end user, you'll end up developing something that's in a sense um, personalized to them, but may not generalize to other people. So there is this question about who the end users are and um, is there a typical end user? And if there isn't, how do you account for the different groups or the different types of people who'll be using this device. So I think, um, you know, sometimes the idea that there might be a typical end user can be quite problematic because you can really then do something that doesn't work for others. Yeah, I hope that's a helpful answer to that question. And um, Gordon, I'll write answers to some of these others into the great. chat. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Christina. And, 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 it, and it really is a, a critical issue and uh, something that we have to try and get right. Uh, and of course, uh, many times we're also trying to uh, convince the, the reviewers or the funders as well that we've got that pitch just right. So uh, that's a discussion I'm sure that will continue amongst us for some time because it's something that is, is really very important. So again, Katrina, thank you uh, on behalf of everyone. That, that was a great presentation. Uh, and we'll move on to our next uh, presentation, uh, which is from Amy Gelmi at uh, RMIT. And I see Amy, Amy's on the screen, ready to rock and roll. All right. Um, so yeah, so my name's Amy and today I wanted to take on a little bit of a trip of where I started my research career uh, with the Intelligent Formal Research Institute and ACES uh, way back during my PhD. Uh, I then did five years postdocing overseas uh, and then came back to Australia to take on a PI position at RMIT as a Vice Chancellor's Research Fellow. And you now you throw in a lot of travel, a wedding, a couple of babies, and it turns out there's quite a journey uh, for me, starting in Australia and then coming back. So I thought I would just go through that today. Okay, so, uh, where are we? My screen's not updating, there we go. So in the beginning, uh, I did my PhD, uh, obviously, at IPRI uh, with Higo and Gordon Wallace, and obviously working with Michael, I did a lot of AFM. And so my thesis was entitled Probing Nanoscale Properties of Organic Conducting Polymer Interfaces Using AFM. And my whole PhD was kind of investigating the physical properties of conductive polymer biomaterials using AFM. And so we looked at how different biological dopants perhaps changed the physical properties of these materials and also the biological benefit that these uh, different biological dopants might have added uh, to the conductive polymers and looking at how they interface with different biological systems. And so we did that with characterizing the physical properties and correlating that with some of the cell work that was being done at IPRI. And then also looking at how extracellular matrix uh, proteins sense the dopants that were present in the polymer. And we also did this all in the context of electrical stimulation because they're conductive polymers you know, the idea is that they would be uh, conducting electricity when they're interfacing with biology. And so we wanted to study perhaps how these properties changed. And we saw that they did change and it was uh, really important to take that into account. Uh, and so I've just got a few pictures from some of the, the papers there uh, that we did during, the, during my PhD. Uh, 
Um, and a lot of this work also helped uh, with the collaboration with Dublin City University, so you know, classic ACES. Uh, and I was also awarded the Bill Wheeler Award uh, in the last year of my PhD. And that was a really great uh, opportunity for me because it let me give a public symposium uh, through the, at the Bill Wheeler, Bill Wheeler Symposium, which was really nice to kind of talk to the community. And it also supported my first trip to Europe. And I got to work in a couple of labs, one in Finland in Tampere and uh, Christine Kranz lab in Ulm in Germany, and as well attend a big conference in Paris. And so that was kind of like the really exciting, like, oh, science, I get to travel, I get to go and meet other labs, meet other people, um, which really kind of instilled like this, this expectation about uh, going overseas uh, for research. And so the kind of main takeaway that I got from doing my PhD at IPRI was um, one, it was the multidisciplinary group that was there um, and still is there. You know, we had chemists, we had uh, biologists, we had uh, engineers, we, we had, you know, a whole gamut of people working there all together in this really big research lab. Um, and then kind of the finer details, like it really kind of got me interested in how biomaterials interface with the bio, um, you know, that bridge between bio and materials, what's going on, how can we improve these materials, how can we use them to kind of control and manipulate this interface. And that's kind of was the very little seed of kind of where I ended up heading towards and, and looking at these materials under electrical stimulation, adding in this kind of this temporal this stimulus side of it. It's not just a passive material sitting there, we're changing things, we're, we're creating new uh, environments for the cells to interact with. And that was a really important kind of basis uh, for my research career. And so, you know, I had a really good uh, PhD experience uh, and I was, I was there and I graduated in 2012. Um, I think my PhD was technically awarded in 2013, but uh, in 2012, I moved on to my first uh, postdoc position. Oh, just gonna highlight the most important point from my own PhD, which was that conductive polymer biomaterials change important biological interactions upon stimulation. Okay. So, Finished my PhD looking for other opportunities, and uh, one came up, and that was to join Edwin Jager uh, in Sweden at Linköping. And so Edwin's been an ongoing collaborator with IPRI uh, for a long time. He used to come over on sabbaticals uh, to Wollongong, I'm pretty sure just to escape uh, Swedish winter, um, and science was probably a second there. Um, but you know, Edwin had this really exciting uh, project going on back in Sweden, and that was to create an electroactive scaffold for cardiac tissue engineering. And so this was still in the sphere of materials um, using conductive polymers, specifically polypyrrole, uh, but it was starting to go towards the biology of tissue engineering. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. You know, I'll be able to take my research a step further and start actually working with cells instead of just proteins. And so this project, uh, we developed a conductive polymer coated scaffold, uh, and it was both electrically conductive and mechanically actuating. So let me just play the video. Uh, so that's going and so you can see that we actually when we're applying the electrical stimulus uh, we got the actuation of the fibers in the polymer we kind of called it you know the Swedish massage the idea was that we were uh, stimulating uh, induced pluripotent stem cells both electrically and mechanically and it was an omnidirectional mechanical stimulation with the idea that we were trying to mimic the cardiac environment that has electrical signals and this kind of uh, physical stress and strain on the cells and so we were working with the biologists, so I was still in the material side of things, working with biologists, and we put the induced polyripotent stem cells on there, stimulated them in vitro, and we actually saw an increase in the cardiac markers uh, when they were stimulated, uh, which was really exciting. And it was one of the first uh, demonstrations of stimulating RPS cells uh, with a conductive polymer and getting this cardiac response. And so, Again, one of the main takeaways from this was that this electrical stimulation can influence stem cell response uh, via conductive biomaterials. And it's something that's it's worth looking into further. And this really piqued my interest uh, in learning how stem cells feel and respond to electrical stimulation, electrical signals, and how does this actually induce a differentiation response. So with mechanical stimulation, we kind of understand the cells are feeling like a strain or a flow and where those pathways might be activated, but electrical stimulation is still a bit, I wasn't really sure. And so with that in mind, I wrote and uh, was awarded um, Mari Skladowska Curie Fellowship uh, to join Imperial College London. So this was a really exciting um, 
So we went from Sweden to the United Kingdom uh, and I joined uh, Molly Stevens Lab, the Stevens Group at Imperial College. And so this again was a really large multidisciplinary group. We had biologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, tissue engineers, um, computational people. We had this a huge group, um, all of postdocs and PhDs. And it was a really exciting place to work because there was a lot of transfer of knowledge and training. And so this really helped expand my skill set. And I started to get a lot of uh, experience working with stem cells. And further than that, just being in Europe, um, and especially being in the UK because it's so well connected at the time, uh, I have developed a really broad international network. And I'm still close with many of the postdocs who've now gone on to have their own labs. Um, and so that's really enhanced my international network and, and being able to know these people and collaborate with them and set up our own grants and things to work further. And, you know, being able to travel all over Europe was really fun. Uh, especially looking back now, it's like, well, I'm glad I took that chance when I got it. Um, a little bit more difficult at the moment. Um, but while I was there at Imperial, the main project that I was doing uh, was investigating how human mesenchymal stem cells responded to electrical stimulus. And so I combined my AFM background and knowledge uh, and creating kind of like uh, simultaneous electrical stimulation with AFM and did it with live cells. And so we were trying to track uh, changes in the stiffness and the biomechanical properties of these stem cells with electrical stimulus. Uh, because we're trying to understand perhaps new pathways on how uh, the biomechanics of stem cells is changing uh, under electrical stimulation. And we teased this idea out a little bit more. We saw some really interesting things. Um, and I came away from the group uh, coming back to Australia with a much deeper knowledge and skills working with stem cells and understanding more of the biology side of it instead of just being a materials person. I was slowly sliding into the sticky kind of bio world there. And, not just on my own work, but I did a lot of work in the lab, uh, a lot of AFM work. We did a lot of live cell, uh, single cell adhesion with fine materials. Uh, just end up being the AFM person in the group, which was great for my papers. Um, but also I got to work with a lot of different uh, systems and using AFM to study them, which, which I love because AFM was always my favorite thing for my PhD. And so, and so coming away from there was I was really interested in pursuing the new pathways and understanding how stem cells are transducing this electrical signal. So further building on this whole conductive polymer conductive interfaces work. And that brings me to where I am now. So I'm at RMIT. Um, I have a vice chancellor's research fellowship. Um, so I've established my own group here. And that sounds, you know, very seamless and easy. Like, oh, I went overseas and then I came back again. Um, there was quite a few unsuccessful job applications in that time, trying to get back to Australia. Uh, two unsuccessful DEPRAs, um, but in the end, you know, I was lucky enough to get this Vice Chancellor's Research Fellowship here, and uh, and I've been working hard to kind of establish uh, a research group that is really looking at how we can manipulate stem cell response using external physical stimuli. And so, kind of the whole research platform is trying to integrate our smart materials with our smart biology and looking at it a little bit deeper. And, using new methodologies to study these responses in real time. Um, so a lot of atomic force microscopy, but also some high throughput approaches. And the whole aim of this is kind of taking it a step further. And we're looking at targeting patient-derived tissue engineering, so tailored specific outcomes using adult mesenchymal stem cells. And so the reason reasoning behind this is that, you know, when we're working with adult stem cells, they can be applied to many different tissue engineering applications. You now we can do musculoskeletal, osteogenic repair, bone repair, cardiac repair. So for example, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, uh, chondrogenic tissue engineering, cartilage replacement, toy or ACL, uh, and neural tissue engineering. So for perhaps even disease platforms and studying uh, neural tissue that way. If we're working with adult uh, stem cells, with patient stem cells, then the idea is that we've got a reduced immunogenic risk. So if we're creating tissue from your own stem cells, it's less likely that your body's going to reject it. And adult stem cells are also a lot more ethically uh, unambiguous. You know, we can harvest them from the patient's bone marrow, subcutaneous adipose tissue, even uh, dental pulp as well, all various sources that are easy to get from a, from a patient. And the idea is that we can take these, tissue, these stem cells, culture them externally on biomaterials, and target specific differentiation outcomes depending on what that patient wants. So maybe they've come in and they've you need bone tissue. Okay, let's take your stem cells, turn them into bone tissue. Are you torn your ACL, come in or turn it into cartilage? You know, very broadly speaking, that's kind of the general idea of this area. And the reason why we're interested in using biomaterials is 
we can use them to direct stem cell fate. It's not just the passive cues. So this harkens all the way back to my, the start of my PhD work. Where we looked at how roughness and topography and stiffness will obviously change on a biomaterial as you change the properties, uh, but also that will in induce how different cells respond. You know, we can actually control stem cell differentiation just purely through stiffness of the substrate. And there's also the dynamic cues. So drug release, uh, we heard Lila talk about this earlier, obviously, obviously very important. The physical stimulation, so some of the stuff that I've done with uh, the stress and strain, the swelling, actuation, and switchable bioactivity. Um, again, through uh, some of the work that we did with DCU was again, switching our surface so that we had different chemical interactions. So all these can be used to direct stem cell fate, which is why they're quite interesting to look at. And so just to finally kind of wrap it up is, uh, oh, Okay, which brings me to the ARC discovery project. So I talked about those failed decras. Well, one of those I rewrote into a DP and it was, I got it, so that was very exciting. So it's with um, Professor Kate Fox and I'm the lead chief investigator on it. And what we're doing is trying to take a dual stimulation approach, uh, similar to what we used in Sweden, providing that electrical and mechanical stimulus, uh, but trying to understand if a global physical stimuli will result in a more efficient or greater effect from stem cell differentiation. Can we identify different electrical stimulation protocols that are going to uh, deliver different uh, stem cell fate outcomes? And can we promote one differentiation pathway over another? And so we're, with Kate Fox, the, that part of the project is creating uh, dual stimulation bioreactors um, to stimulate populations of adult stem cells. And then the other half is kind of my baby, bringing in the AFM uh, to perform single cell characterization with electrical stimulus uh, to track cell biomechanics and try to understand what's going on there. This is really super exciting, but uh, we commenced the project in 2020. My PhD students started in April 2020, so not great timing. So we haven't got too far without being shut down, but now Melbourne's finally opening up. Um, you know, my maternity leave, my second maternity leave is over. So now we're back in the lab and we're starting to do some really exciting work. So hopefully we'll be able to share that with everybody soon. And just some final thoughts, um, thinking back you know, this is ACES Symposium, the legacy, you know, at IPRI and ACES, I really developed an interest and the skills working with the conductive polymer biomaterials and of course AFM. When I went to Sweden, I started working with biologists and clinicians, people who told us, what do we actually need? If we wanted to get something into the clinic. What do they need? What are the, the parameters of creating these um, scaffold devices? And how do we interface directly with stem cells? When I got to London, started bringing back in those AFM skills and conductive polymers uh, to interface with the stem cells, learning how to do that myself and starting to develop my own seed of my research group and what I really wanted to look at. And now, you know, I'm back in Australia. I have my own multidisciplinary group uh, and we're starting to pursue innovative approaches in manipulating stem cells. Um, but I think my biggest takeaway is that the multidisciplinary research is key, or it's at least the most interesting to me. Um, and I think that's what ACES was really good at uh, developing and really introduced me as a little fresh-faced PhD student uh, all that time ago. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so finally, just uh, the acknowledgements, Michael, Gordon, Edwin and Molly as my supervisors through these years, my group now, and my two greatest tissue engineering accomplishments, uh, Teddy and Alexander. So, yeah, so thanks. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Amy, for that uh, geographical and technological tour de force. It was uh, that was brilliant. What what amazing achievements in a in a confined and defined uh, period of time. Well, well, well done. Uh, we've only got time for one question live, and then we'll go. To, you know, I'll let you go to the rest on the screen. And and this one, I think, it's from Johnston. Uh, can electrical stimulation direct MSCs to differentiate into particular lineages? Uh, if so, can you comment on it becoming chondrocytes? It's very good and I, I presume we, I'll just maybe refine that question because I presume what Johnson's referring to is electrical stimulation through conducting polymers because we know that's quite different uh, from just straightforward electrical stimulation. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's definitely a difference. Uh, Ten minutes, not a lot of time to go into it, but with the field and the direct electrodes, so I'm interested in that direct electrode. So the, there's been evidence of electrical stimulation promoting chondrogenic differentiation of MSCs. Um, and what, what I'm really trying to get to the bottom of is people are using lots of, there's a few different parameters that people are using and they can get osteogenic, adipogenic, chondrogenic, even some neural from MSCs uh, differentiation, but there is no uh, consistency. There's no, um, 
no one really knows why different parameters work. You know, people are like, oh, we, we did this pulse duration for this many days, this kind of potential window or this current injection. There's not really any basis on, on what works and what doesn't. That's what I'm trying to find out is, is there something specifically, um, are there specific waveforms? Is it what specifically in the cell is, is being acted upon when we apply this electrical stimulus through an electrode or through a field? Um, and can we fine tune those four specific outcomes? And the answer is it's a really good question, Johnson, and I'm trying to answer it. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an exciting. It's a very, very complicated question as I found out, <laughs> which I started answering in London. I'm like, oh, this is much more complicated. Yeah, yeah, but still, the, the, the outcomes could be incredibly exciting. So Thanks. good luck with it all. And again, thank you, Emmy, for that brilliant presentation. We better move on. We're running a little bit behind time. Um, and our next uh, presenter is Char Bell. Good afternoon, everyone. I am really happy to be here sharing my research or the research that I have done for the last four or five years with an ASUS and the University of Wollongong. Uh, Australia. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be again with you presenting and be part of this incredible. Uh, today I will talk mainly about the soft robotics research uh, that we've uh, all worked on uh, within ACES uh, from 2016 until 2020 and it's still currently an ongoing and uh, very exciting and active uh, project. So just a brief summary about uh, what uh, I have done uh, throughout my PhD. The main objective of my PhD with ACES and UOW when I joined back in 2015 was to develop low cost 3D printable soft actuators and sensors that can be used in diverse soft robotic applications. We've used, or actually we've developed uh, many types of actuators and sensors, and we have used them in diverse range of soft robotic applications, wearable applications, uh, including uh, wearable sensors. And when it comes to robot, we've used them uh, in locomotion robots, artificial muscles, and soft grippers. So uh, you can see here the diverse uh, applications uh, that really were uh, realized based on the 3D printed actuators and sensors. Uh, from soft adaptive grippers for dexterous manipulation uh, to human machine interfaces, including soft prosthetic hands and wearable devices, to soft fingers that can be used in bilateral control and uh, uh, soft grippers and prosthetic hands again, and even for uh, uh, entertainment or STEM education uh, platforms. So, including joysticks here. Uh, human machine interfaces, uh, touch buttons for interactive pianos. So we will see a video shortly about this one. And finally, artificial muscles and locomotion robots. So it, it was really an exciting journey because we can really uh, realize like, or we realized all these exciting uh, devices based on what we have done in ASUS uh, and UOW. So I will start uh, uh, with my PhD research. Uh, so the first project I've worked on was on bio-inspired soft vacuum actuators, and this one was inspired by fernet trees. We had uh, a fernet tree just uh, next to our lab uh, based uh, in UOW's campus. So really this tree was, uh, or it was the main source of inspiration uh, for us to come up with the first, uh, uh, if I can say, actuation concept. So here you can say the actuators, which are inspired by fernet trees, so these are vacuum-based 3D printable actuators. So once we suck the air out of uh, the hollow chambers, they generate a bending motion. So this one was 3D printed using used deposition modeling 3D printers and commercially available materials. So here's our famous uh, robot, which, uh, which is called Gongaroo, uh, which is a combination of Wollongong and Australian kangaroos. So this one was based on the uh, soft, uh, vacuum actuators. Another uh, soft actuation concept we developed was soft linear actuators. So in the first one, we developed bending soft actuators. However, in the second one, we developed uh, soft actuators that can generate a linear stroke. And for this purpose, we have used these actuators in multiple applications, including uh, uh, soft uh, artificial muscles that can be used in humanoid robots and in assistive devices as well. 
In terms of a human machine interfaces, uh, we have 3D printed soft pneumatic uh, chambers uh, that can be used in wearable devices, STEM education platforms, and many other interesting applications. For instance, here we have uh, fabricated a 3D printable soft wearable glove that can be put directly on the hand to track the motion in real time. So uh, this is a very interesting application and it proved really that is a very important one during the pandemic because we were approached uh, by a surgeon in Australia that was really interested in such kind of wearable gloves, gloves for pele rehabilitation. Another example is that you can control uh, soft uh, grippers or any soft robotic device from far distances or remotely using the wearable gloves. Again, they are low cost, they are customizable, uh, lightweight and easy or comfortable to wear. Another example is that we can build uh, STEM education platforms and interactive platforms like, such as this uh, piano where we are play, playing, I think, Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. So these push buttons were 3D printed, even the base were, uh, was 3D printed, and these can be really put in many different forms. So these can be really, really useful for high school students in order to attract them into the STEM uh, field. We have also worked uh, on soft grippers and soft robotic fingers, as I mentioned, with embedded sensing and actuation capabilities. This was the first gripper we have built, uh, which was uh, put on a 60 OF arms. And this soft gripper was a gold medal award winner uh, at the 2018 IEEE International Conference on Robotics and Automation. So it was really exciting. The gripper could successfully grasp 20 different objects uh, in one, Go. So this was the main uh, aim of the competition, and it, well, it, was, it won the first uh, prize. Another example is where we can embed our soft pneumatic chambers inside 3D printable soft robotic structures, such as this soft robotic fingers, and we can use the signals of these chambers in order to achieve real-time force and uh, uh, position control. This great work was done uh, in collaboration with my uh, colleague, Dr. Howe, who is now within also uh, UOW and ACES. In terms of col uh, collaborative research, I've worked uh, during my PhD with many different researchers, within ACES, UOW, who built soft monolithic grippers, 3D printable grippers, for conformal grasping, soft haptic devices, and soft capacitive and resistive sensors uh, for diverse uh, wearable electronic applications. So in terms of soft grippers, we have developed uh, soft grippers that can be 3D printed in one go with embedded auxetic structures for conformal grasping. For instance, here we have a soft gripper that can grasp an egg very delicately without the need of any sensors or any control uh, commands. In terms of soft, uh, soft sensors, we have developed soft foam sensors uh, with Dr. Vitor Tsenkedas. Uh, they are soft capacitive and resistive sensors uh, we have developed foam and stretchable sensors, and we've used these ones in uh, many, many applications, including touch sensors uh, for soft grippers, touch sensors for human machine interfaces, such as this screen, and uh, uh, soft interfaces or uh, human machine interfaces for STEM education as well. So, in terms of soft resistive sensors, here you can see an example where we put these sensors on a three finger gripper in order to really. Uh, sense the touch uh, of uh, whenever uh, the, of the gripper is touching an object. In terms of soft capacitive sensors, we developed also foam sensors, and this work was led by Vitor, and these can be used uh, in wearable electronic applications. So here we can see that these capacitive sensors can be used to track the position or monitor the position uh, in real time. In terms of my postdoctoral work, I uh, mainly worked on two projects, one on soft uh, grippers with embedded sensors for force control, so for fine, delicate uh, touch, and another one, again, was how on uh, soft prosthetic uh, hands. So in the first one, uh, we developed a 3D printable soft gripper with embedded pneumatic sensors, and there we could achieve real-time force control to really uh, uh, have a very fine touch or a very aggressive touch depending on the environment. So this gripper could grasp any object from super soft or extremely soft to extremely rigid using the same controller, 
the same settings, the same everything. So we don't need to change anything, which proved its versatility. Another uh, project was the soft prosthetic hand, uh, which uh, this one is currently under review and was done uh, by myself and Paul. So here's an example of the soft prosthetic hand, which is embedded with sensors and actuators. And these two, the position and the force control or the touch chambers are used to achieve really uh, this dexterous uh, uh, performance or manipulation. Finally, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the simulation. So uh, in, in the design process or uh, whenever uh, for each of these uh, of these works that I have just presented, we've always used finite element simulations and FEM uh, were, uh, was really an essential or an integral part of any of these projects because we could simulate all these structures, actuators, sensors, and devices prior to their fabrications, optimize their performance predicted, and then fabricated. So here's an example showing how the finite element simulations can predict very accurately the performance of the real actuators. In terms of the vision, so uh, it was really exciting and uh, I'm still working with uh, so many projects with uh, ACES colleagues and UOW colleagues. Uh, so hopefully we hope that these really will make an impact, will have an impact on the world and hopefully will help in solving future challenges. And uh, we're really still uh, very excited to see what the future holds. Uh, last but not least, I, I would like to thank, uh, to thank ACES, uh, firstly, uh, for supporting all my research uh, and the University of Wollongong, and uh, all my colleagues from my supervisors uh, to my colleagues that have helped me along the way. Really, it was a teamwork. Uh, I believe that uh, we can do very little alone. Uh, all of the work I just showed you, it was a combination of really talents coming together. So many thanks to all of them, from my supervisors to my colleagues. And thank you very much. That's all from me. I am happy to answer any questions. That's uh, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Ishabel. Thanks for joining us from Dubai. Uh, we've got a few questions and comments in the chat. We've probably just got time to uh, address one. Um, and it's from your colleague, How. Uh, in what areas do you think we have the best opportunity to achieve translation of soft robotics? There you go. There's a simple question for you, Chaba. Uh, from what I'm seeing right now, I think there's a lot of potential for wearable soft robotic devices. We can see that Facebook or what's now called Meta, they are using soft robotics to build wearable gloves for haptic feedback and for the interaction with uh, the virtual environment. I think there's a great opportunity there to develop commercial wearable devices to interact in the metaverse. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, I probably got time for one more. I'm just going to sneak one in myself, uh, Chaibel. So, in terms of the three D current three D printing technologies, are there any limitations that you see in terms of the the three D printed prosthetic devices? I mean, what what would you like to see in a new set of 3D printers that could make that job better? There are uh, mainly two things. The first thing is materials. We need really to come very close with materials scientists. So uh, we need to collaborate more, talk more, and come together because materials is an essential component for us to succeed in soft robotics. And these materials, they need to be uh, designed or uh, invented in a way that they can be 3D printed. So we still have faced some limitations in terms of the materials performance, even uh, the ones that are commercial and can be 3D printed. I think when we break this barrier, when we can advance 3D printing technologies, along with the materials that can be used with these 3D printing technologies, we will have limitless opportunities when it comes to soft robotics. And especially when it comes to 3D printing structures directly with integrated sensing and actuation capabilities. Great. Okay. Thanks again on behalf of everyone, Chobel, and uh, hopefully uh, some pleasure. of us will get to catch up with you in Dubai in February for the World Expo. Uh, but uh, thanks for your presentation today. Uh, brilliant stuff. Keep, keep up that Thank great you. work. Brilliant. Uh, and I'll move on to our final presentation of this session, uh, Peter Sherrill from the University of Melbourne.
who I can see is, is on screen and, and rare in the go. So I'm going to hand over to Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Peter Sherrill. Um, I'm currently an Elizabeth and Vernon Fusey Research Fellow uh, at the University of Melbourne. Um, and what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is the way uh, ASIS's engagement and training um, I've taken from before my PhD even through different 1D, 2D nanomaterials and structured them into whatever architectures we want uh, to unlock a specific property. So while I was listening to those wonderful talks that we've all just sat through, I had a shocking realization. I first stepped into a lab in what was then the Intelligent Polymer Research Institute in 2004. Now I'm 35 now and in 2004 I was 18. So I've spent nearly half my life in some level engaged with ACES. Um, and so this was because I did a Bachelor of Nanotechnology at the University of uh, Wollongong. Um, this was something set up by Jeff Sphinx and Will Price. And uh, basically it was designed to get um, people engaged with researchers from an early stage. So over the summer scholarship projects, um, I was in the lab working in IPRI all the way through my undergrad and then into my PhD. So at this stage, most of what I did was looking at 1D materials. We were looking at carbon nanotubes. I think the very first project I did was working with Philip Whitten um, and looking at trying to uh, make carbon nanotube bucky papers and see if they would inflate inside arteries for scents, things like this. We then looked at incorporating biomaterials to try to improve, um, so things like hydrazan to improve the stability of carbon nanotube dispersions before moving into what most of what I do now, which is electrochemical energy storage and conversion devices. Um, so after my honours, uh, I decided to stick around and do a PhD with Andrew Manette, Jun Chen and Gordon. And that was looking at proton exchange membrane fuel cells, again, using carbon nanotubes, but rather than these, um, rather than these uh, sort of flat planar architectures, um, we were starting to look at adding different dimensionalities of nanomaterials on there. So we we're putting on different metal nanoparticles. We we're looking at trying to structure um, very thin carbon layers underneath it to change the properties of what we're trying to do. Um, when I finished my PhD, I went, well, we have this opportunity that's wonderful to travel and see the world. So I went over to Linchapin University and started to look at using graphene for tissue engineering um, before in 2015, uh, switching my mind completely and going, you know what, I've had enough of carbon. I want something that's much more colorful. I'm sick of working with gray materials and looking at some different 2D materials. So we started looking at uh, transition metal ditrochrogenide, uh, some metal organic frameworks, and some perovskite type 2D materials where we could manipulate their structure very, very dramatically just by changing either the synthesis conditions or our processing techniques. Um, and here's where we started to play with something that I still do a lot of work in now, which is catalysis for water splitting, photocatalysis, photoelectric catalysis, and this type of thing. Um, in 2019, we came back to Australia um, and I started at the University of Melbourne. And now what we do is take all those skills that we got from 2004 and try to translate those properties into new materials. So we look at taking nanomaterial properties, transferring them into polymers, um, looking at catalysis, looking at energy harvesting, so mechanical to electrical energy conversion and things like this. Now, through all of these, what, I'm interest, what I've always been interested in is not just the nanomaterial itself. So we're looking at, up the top here, um, uh, SLM printed structure by Steve Byrne, um, that we went and grew that three-dimensional carbon nanotube network I showed before through. Um, so you start to get practical devices out of this. Down the bottom, we've done the same thing with a polymer that's produced by what's called a nanoscribe um, and grown a 2D transition metal dichotomy through it. So it's about taking those individual nanomaterials and making some sort of structure out of it. Now, all of the things that are so integral to what ACES is, um, in terms of scalar, na exploiting nanomaterial properties, ethical research, and the multidisciplinary experience of it, really defines the research that we look at doing now. So the broad, the broad catch-all phrase is engineering the structure of nanomaterials to create new or improved electromechanical properties. That means everything and nothing. But what we actually end up doing is looking at everything ranging from energy storage, supercapacitors, lithium ion batteries, um, catalytic energy conversion, electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, more recently things like piezocatalysis, trying to lower that energy barrier in a different way, collaborate through the biomaterial space for nerve cell growth, cardiac tissue and stem cell therapy, 
And what I'm going to talk very, very briefly about in the interest of time today is our latest work where we're looking at trying to take these nanomaterials and make better energy harvesters. So take mechanical energy or environmental energy and getting electricity out um, very, very easily. So this work's really only started over the past couple of years and we've been mostly focused on piezoelectricity and polymers. So this is, you get a polymer film, you apply a mechanical deformation or stress and it converts it to an electrical signal, typically charge. Um, and what we've shown here is that if you use some sort of nanomaterials, you can dramatically improve how much charge you get out. Um, the longer we looked into this, the more of a struggle things became because we realized the literature was absolutely a mess. So it's really important to understand exactly how someone does measurement on piezoelectricity. And importantly, if they're aware of, or if they've accounted for something called triboelectricity, which is friction at polymer interfaces or indeed any material interfaces that can lead to charge that looks basically identical, identical to piezoelectricity. Um, I'm going to briefly walk through the follow-up work to this one on the left here, just to give you an idea of what we're doing. So because piezoelectricity is a little bit different to what I think a lot of people work on here now, I'm just gonna give a very brief overview. Um, what you need for something to take mechanical energy and make electricity out is you need a dipole moment across your polymer. So this is PVDF, you have fluorine on one side, hydrogen on the other, electrons sit on the fluorine atoms because it's more electronegative, so you have a net dipole. That doesn't matter if it's on a single polymer chain unless you align the polymer chains into some sort of crystallite. This doesn't matter if you have an aligned crystallite if all the crystallite don't align themselves with your polymer film, because they'll all cancel out and you'll get a net zero charge. So how people have traditionally overcome this is they put two electrodes on the top and bottom of the polymer and flick a switch and pump through anywhere up to 100 megavolts per meter of electric field across your polymer film. And this causes all these polymer crystallites to twist and align um, in a single direction. The problem with this is no one wants to spend 100 megavolts a meter to make a piezoelectric energy harvester. You're never going to save that energy over the lifetime of the device. So it's just pointless and it's really limited anyone trying to move forward with this sort of technology on a, on a really wide ranging, large scale system. But regardless, if you do this, you have this polarized sample, you can apply a stress and get electric power out, or alternatively, you can apply electric field and cause it to vibrate. But there simply has to be an easy way to do this. And what we've been looking at, as I hinted already, is trying to use a nanomaterial template and exploiting the properties of the nanomaterial to locally orient how those dipoles, how those crystallites align in a film. So the idea is to use something with a high aspect ratio, so all the polymer can absorb onto the surface and stack in a certain way. Um, use a polymer with a really big dipole moment, that addresses dipole moment on the polymer the assembly of the polymer into a crystallite. And then to align all these things, we go back to that, go back to that aspect ratio point, which is we use 3D printing to attempt to get some sort of pseudo shear alignment of our nanomaterial in a polymer film, which then would lead to microscale polarization. So this is all fine, but this is a huge assumption. Why on earth would polymer films assemble with polarization all going in a certain way? Well, it turns out one of the 2D materials we've been working with, which is Maxine, it's sort of a magical material for this. It has an electrostatic field that goes around the Maxine that's about 10 nanometers above and below the basal plane. And what this means is if you drop a polymer with a dipole around it, the polymer will spontaneously orient with respect to that electrostatic radius. Um, most materials, so graphene that we see on the left, sorry if I can get this to replay. Um, graphene on the left here doesn't have this elect electrostatic field, so you get no alignment. So what we see here is the red arrow is the dipole of the 2D, but this blue arrow that's pointing vertical for the maxine and floating everywhere for the graphene is the dipole of the polymer film. So we know we lock it all together. Um, and that's a really critical understanding and discovery that most people weren't aware of you do. And what we found is if we take this, um, you get this initial alignment of polymer film and it crystallizes out even at very low weight concentrations into bulk films. So what we can do with this understanding is we can take it a step further. We can go and we can 3D print it. 
which you can see it's not playing. Um, it takes about 30 seconds for 3D print. Um, it costs about um, 50 cents to make one of these three by three centimeter sheets. Um, and we can harvest energy with the worst way to ever test case electricity, which is an artificial finger flicking it. But you can see the charge output on the right here. And if we compare our nanomaterial templated material with commercial devices, we are about 25% better. And we do this without that 100 megavolts per meter input energy. So suddenly your efficiency and your lifetime and um, overall benefit of the device is so, so much higher. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail just in the interest of time, but moving forwards, we've got to keep exploiting these dimensionally confined nanomaterials, uh, particularly with their properties, aspect ratio, surface area volume, band structures, and of course, surface chemistry to design materials with unique properties. Um, and one of the things that often gets missed is a lack of understanding of mechanisms. So one of the other things that we're really diving into at the moment is trying to understand exactly what's going on at an atomic and molecular level to enable all this charge transfer and energy harvesting to happen. Um, I'm going to stop there because I'm pretty sure I'm about to get gonged. But um, just to say thank you to some key people, uh, particularly Nick Heflin, for his PhD was on uh, the piezoelectric and he drove most of it. Irene Gudeli, who did the molecular dynamic simulations there um, and everyone else on this slide. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I've also got a off the top of my head list of all the people who I should thank at ACES. Um, I'm sure I've missed you uh, if you're not on here and I'm sorry about that. There are just too many to keep writing. Fair enough. <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks Peter. That, that, that's uh, an uh, amazing journey again and, and it's great to see how you and, uh, and, and in fact all of the presenters today have, have forged incredibly exciting areas in, in recent years. Uh, obviously brilliant things uh, to come out of those new investigations. Um, we do have a, a question here, um, which I've lost uh, from Attila. I think it was around the, does the orientation, is it stable with time? I mean, once you get that alignment, does it stay there? Yep. So what's really interesting about it is if you put the, Maxine, let me just go back and share my screen again. If you pop the, um, the polymer in the Maxine's, uh, what you see uh, is your ink actually stays completely stable for a really, really long period of time. So these are titanium carbides and typically they'll start to aggregate, and they'll start to oxidize. Um, but because the polymer forms this film around it and wraps it so tightly in a folate, it doesn't happen. Um, so in solution, we have these little floating crystallites of polymer around the maxine that's locked. It does not move. Um, on the next slide here, I think, yeah, on the next slide here, sorry, I've doubled up for some reason when I pasted it. This image on the left here is a map of the probability of that polarization vector with distance from a maxine sheet. And so you can see once we're about four nanometers away from the surface, it's 90 degrees. It doesn't move. Um, what I didn't talk about in, in this presentation, because we need to do more validation, we really got stuck with COVID, was if, if, you look at, um, if you look at this, where we talk about shear alignment, this is all nanotubes. So for nanotubes, we need the shear alignment to get any sort of um, net polarization. For maxines, we can drop cast it because they naturally settle flat. So that gives you an idea of how stable and how consistent that directionality of it is. Yeah, brilliant. So we might make it start. And welcome everyone to the afternoon session. So I'm Jenny Pringle from Deakin University and I'll be chairing the Burster session. So a rapid round of, of more uh, insights and uh, from our ACE people and in, in terms of what they've been doing. So first up, we have um, Joaria. Um, Hello, are you ready to, hi there, are you ready to share your slides? Yeah. So these are all 10 minute talks, so including questions. So keep an eye on the time. I will Gordon's gonna Gordon's got a big gong that he's desperate to use if you go over time. <laughs> um, so, all right. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, Javeria here. I just finished my PhD with ACES and today I'll present on integration of fiber-based electrofluidics with wireless bipolar electrochemistry towards low cost analysis. As we know, point of care testing using microfluidic technology is critical to emergent healthcare devices for rapid and robust responses. 
However, two major barriers to the success of this approach are the prohibitive cost and complex fabrication methods for making microfluidic devices. Also, the pure sensitivity due to small sample volumes in microfluidic formats, especially for monitoring low abundance biomarkers. This led to a focus on exploring new material and fabrication methods, and as a result, some back to basic approaches have emerged, like the use of fibers in textiles, which are versatile, low cost, possesses capital reactions, and flexible enough to be converted into 2D and 3D constructs for sophisticated fluid transport devices. However, to obtain controllable devices and precise fluid control, a driving force other than simple wicking action is required. Uh, so here we explored a groundbreaking new approach where we used electric field for precise fluid control and migration of solutes to migrate for the migration of solutes on the surface of fiber constructs. The fluid held as a surface layer within the fiber capillaries generate both uh, EOF and solute electrophoretic migrations in controlled manner on application of electric field and as a result charge analytes uh, separate electrophoretically based on their charge to size ratio. More significantly with close environmental controls and proper surface modifications, it become possible to mimic separations formally achievable within capillaries uh, on this open surface accessible system. So the overall aim of the project was to develop this novel approach for the rapid and direct characterization of solutes on these low cost textile constructs in an inverted uh, visionary in contrast to closed glass capillaries where direct access to the sample zone during separation is nearly impossible. So for this purpose, we studied the electrophoretic properties of a range of uh, commercially available textile fibers. <clears throat> and we found that polyester is the best suitable fiber for fiber-based electrophoresis due to its highly negative zeta potential over a wide range of pH. Moreover, braiding uh, technique, uh, which was used for the fabrication of 3D textile constructs, being simple and versatile, also offered the potential for selective migration of solute to targeted different channels. Further, we demonstrated that the versatility of the system and showed how composite uh, braid made the answer of differential surface chemistries revealed a unique behavior of separation and parallel movement of oppositely charged solutes. In the next step, uh, uh, we address the second major challenge, which is the poor sensitivity and high limit of detection of point of care microfluidic devices. To address this, several on chip pre concentration methods have been developed, and the most commonly uh, used are the iron mobility gradient methods, which is a very, uh, 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 like ITP, which is far complex than the electric field gradient focusing methods. Um, so, there are several methods to generate the electric field uh, gradient within the microfluidic channels, uh, uh, but here we um, developed a novel and simplest method to generate an electric field gradient within the microchannels uh, using a wireless bipolar electrode. So here is uh, the simplest example of BPE electrochemical cell in an electrolyte solution with two driving electrodes which generates Faraday reactions on BPE on application of critical potential between driving electrodes. The poles of the BPE arrange themselves in opposite polarity to the driving electrode. So here we demonstrate that an in situ metal electrode in electrolyte field textile channel results in the interficial potential difference at the surface of the BPE that varies along its length on, on applying critical potential to driving electrodes. It is these over, -put over potentials at the edges that uh, drive spheredic reactions at the BPE poles. For proof of concept, we added a few drops of universal pH indicator to the trace chest buffer solution and the uh, textile electrofluidic system in both reservoirs. So so um, with the uh, when the uh, voltage was applied, Faradic reactions uh, generate uh, at the uh, BPE uh, poles uh, um, with polarity in opposite direction to driving electrodes. However, when there is no BPE in the system, there is no evidence of uh, Faradic reactions. When the potential difference is high enough, the Faradic reactions proceeding at the BPE may cause water splitting, forming hydroxyl and hydrogen ion, uh, ion species produces at the respective cathodic and anodic poles of BPE. These locally generated uh, ions react with the electrolyte uh, cations, uh, electrolyte cations to neutralize them and form an ion depletion zone near the BPE edge that generates the electric field gradient in the region to concentrate the charge analytes on the boundary 
of EDP. To demonstrate this, we filled the textile channel with anionic fluid and twisted electrolyte solution and an application of electric uh, field, uh, field uh, an ion depletion zone is generated near the cathodic end of PPE, which results in an electric field created in this region that concentrate uh, the anionic fluorescein and migrated it to the respective anodic reservoir. On quantification, we can see that uh, concentration increased with the passage of time until the solute moved to the edge of the reservoir. Actually, there are two kinds of forces that act on the charge and light in an electrofluidic system, the electroosmotic flow and electromigration. In terms uh, at position A, in case of negatively charged ion, the electroosmotic flow is uh, greater than the electromigration uh, that drags the anionic uh, solute towards the uh, cathodic reservoir. However, when there is a BPE in the system, an ion depletion zone is formed, uh, a, a zone that increases the electromigration due to the electric field gradient, high electric field gradients in this region. Uh, so the anionic um, solute uh, moves towards the, um, uh, its respective anode. Now the focused and concentrated uh, ion can be uh, isolated at one position when these two forces become equal in magnitude uh, and which can be achieved by several methods uh, such as uh, by manipulating the driving electric fleets at the driving electrodes or by introduce, introducing some uh, siphon driven force. Therefore, uh, we demonstrated uh, that uh, with controlled conditions, you can see that anionic fluorescein remained focused at one point even for one hour of expel of running the electric field and uh, here with a uh, Gaussian fitting of the peak intensity that uh, you can uh, see that not only the fluorescein remain focused but also its intensity keep on increasing with time that means the concentration keep on increasing and we were able to achieve uh, up to 250 folds of concentration enrichment and in this picture you can see that no fouling was observed on the, uh, the textile based construct even after running the electric high voltage electric field for one hour. So the system was quite robust as well. In the last, uh, we demonstrated minute, the simultaneous please. separation and uh, and uh, separation and isolation and focusing uh, on these open um, integrated system. And here you can see that we were able to uh, um, separate and isolate anionic fluorescein from a complex mixture of the ionic rhodamine B and complex electrolyte system. Uh, with its uh, uh, concentration enrichment and intensity stable over time. However, when there was a no BPE in the system, uh, the uh, charged analytes do separate on the uh, basis of their uh, electrophoretic mobilities, but uh, there were no isolation or concentration enrichment. So in conclusion, um, we developed a simple low cost system using commercial textile materials and we integrated this uh, for electrophoretic separations and we integrated the system with wireless PPE electrochemistry for simultaneous separation isolation and concentration enrichment over that we were able to achieve up to 254 soft uh, concentration enrichment and isolation of uh, our um, uh, salute of interest so with that in the last but not the least, I will uh, acknowledge uh, all ACES members, especially my supervisors, all uh, IPRI staff and colleagues, and all my funding bodies, including HEC Pakistan. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. So we've got one minute for questions, and there's one in the chat um, from Simon. I don't know if you can see this. Does the pitch of the fiber twist affect the transport rate on the fibers at a fixed electric field gradient? Did you understand that question? Um, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't check the twist rate or, uh, or the electric field or transport rate at different twist levels because I use the standard yarn, uh, commercially available yarn. I didn't make the fibers myself. So this parameter is interesting to know, but I didn't check that. Okay, is that a future work suggestion for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much. That's very interesting.
Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, I'm sure it's your, um, we can continue to answer questions in the chat if, if I've cut you off before you got to answer your question, ask your question. All right, next speaker, Insong. Uh, do you want to um, share your slides, please? Yeah. So Insong from the University of Wollongong. So, uh, hi, I'm Insong. Uh, I'm really glad to be here um, to introduce uh, one of my PhD work <clears throat> uh, I recently published. Um, it's titled Significant Impact of Transient Absorption Time Resolution on electron transfer kinetics analyzed by Marcus theory. So during my PhD, uh, I've been working on like measuring uh, electron transfer kinetics, uh, like uh, using these redox active molecules that are like potentially useful in uh, energy conversion devices. So there's uh, a substrate which uh, where the acceptor molecules are attached to the semiconductor surface, and this uh, substrate substrate is immersed in an electrolyte which is containing these donor molecules. So when uh, <clears throat> illuminate this substrate with light, and there is a charge injection to the semiconductor electrode, and then it drives uh, charge transfer reactions between the donor and acceptor molecules. So to get, uh, <clears throat> I mean, getting fast electron transfer in this step is important to use uh, these uh, injected electrons as electrical energy, or uh, we can use it for like catalytic reactions to get value added fuels. So there are like several factors um, significantly affecting these uh, electron transfer kinetics, uh, especially descri described by Marcus theory. I'll introduce three main, three main factors. First is driving force, which means uh, energy difference between the donor and acid molecules. So if you increase the delta G, we can get fast charge transfer kinetics. And this can be done by changing the molecular structure of radix molecules by substituting um, the, uh, some sort of like motifs uh, with uh, different inductive effects. Um, however, increasing the delta G may uh, like often end up with uh, potential energy loss. So uh, one challenge is to get this uh, fast electron transfer with minimized or low delta G change. So another thing is to control the electronic coupling, <clears throat> which is uh, interactions between wave functions of donor and acid molecules. So for example, in one case, there is a like insulating layer making the distance between the donor and acid molecule far to each other. In the case, electron transfer is slow, but in another case, if they close to each other by, for example, intermolecular interactions and things like that, if they have faster uh, electric electron transfer rate by uh, better electronic coupling. And the other thing is reorganization energy, uh, which is basically energy required uh, for electron transfer to have like the same geometry of reactants, same as the products. So it is affected by size of the reactants, uh, donor acceptor distance and dielectric constant of solvent medium. So these kind of uh, things can be determined by measuring the charge transfer rate and plotting them uh, as a function of delta G. So basically, the most important thing here is to um, like determine the fast um, charge transfer rate using uh, at this Marcos parabola, and this Marcos parabola is often obtained by fitting the measured decay rate as a function of delta G using the equation here, Marcos theory of electron transfer equation, <clears throat> because it tells us like. Uh, what the reorganization adjacent energy uh, equals to the delta G at the top of the curve, and then how high the electronic coupling based on the, um, the the location of the like the top of the Marcus curve. So basically, again, important thing is to um, determine the top of the Marcus curve, which has the fastest charge transfer kinetics. So the question is, uh, what would be the like impact of the time resolution of the time transient absorption setup, which is often uh, used. Uh, use like technique to measure transient absorption, uh, this electron transfer kinetics. So basically transient absorption, which is a time resolved spectroscopic technique you know, is often used to uh, determine the charge transfer kinetics. So if you have a look at this uh, upper setup uh, called nano, nano TA setup, which has a, a few nanosecond pass laser as a pump. So basically we can have like this uh, 100 nanosecond to millisecond time scale decay. While if you have like faster setup using a, like uh, a laser with a shorter pass, for example, here we've got a uh, hundred picosecond pass laser. When it's incorporated with uh, some digitizers, it can uh, have um, some like transient absorption decay over nanosecond, even even half nanosecond to uh, hundred nanosecond level. So basically, using those two setups, you have uh, measured exactly the same reactions, but they have different time scales. So for example, if you have a look at this blue region here, uh, if you use this slow nanosecond TA setup, if there is any like decay happens in this region, it's missing. So uh, to identify what's the impact of that, uh, a numerical model 
um, the decay with a uh, stretch exponent function, as exponential function, which is often used um, model to uh, describe the decay. So these two main parameters, one is tau w called stretched exponential decay lifetime, and the other one is beta uh, indicative of how like dispersive the lifetime is over the decay curve. So basically we truncated the <clears throat> entire decay curve, I mean, four decay curves having different tau w and beta at two time scales representing uh, the time resolution of the two setups that we have. So basically depending on the uh, tau w and beta, especially when the tau w is short and then beta is low, which means like uh, the lifetime is distributed over different lifetimes, we can have a uh, fairly significant more than 200% of the error. Um, <clears throat> so this model was um, tested using actual donor acceptor pairs. So basically, first I chose um, one acceptor molecule uh, decorated with this RK chain, and then this is insulating layer blocking the charge transfer reaction. So electron transfer is normally slow. So using those two setup, um, shown as like black and red curve uh, respectively, I uh, also uh, I like both of them uh, was able to. Uh, resolve the initial plateau. So there's no difference in decay rate uh, determined by the T1 half, which is the time it takes to the half of the initial signal decay. So there's no difference in this slow case. But when it comes to the fast electron transfer rate using uh, this porphyrin dye, which has uh, 18 pi conjugated electrons, uh, we have fast electron transfer. <clears throat> so using this slow setup only, uh, it wasn't able to like resolve this initial plateau. So there was a like missing decay region uh, in the earlier time scale. So the error was like 200%. Um, so here we uh, <clears throat> now know uh, to like, it is important to like resolve the initial plateau, but what if we don't have like this fasting of transit absorption setup? One uh, alternative is to fit the curve using um, transit absorption, I mean, stretched exponential function. So basically if, you, if I fit this red region, which was measured only, only with the nanosecond TA, a setup, um, uh, like using these two donor acceptor pair. So this, again, there's a like uh, RK chain substituted the acceptor molecule, but in this case, the donor molecule was different, having different ligand structure so that we want to as a change. Uh, so we have fast electron transfer. So it doesn't show like initial plateau, but somehow the decay was well predicted by the stretch exponential fitting. So it improves the result. However, uh, when we, employ these methoxy substituted uh, cobalt complexes <clears throat> where the methoxy group is uh, additional extra blocking layer to slow down the charge transfer reaction. So even with uh, it's paired with porphyrin, it showed fairly slow electron transfer rate. Um, even though it, had, it showed fairly slow decay rate, uh, um, the fitting didn't really expect the exact uh, curve where it was measured using the faster setup it actually overestimated the decay because this curve didn't follow the stretch exponential behavior. So in that case, the error might be uh, even bigger. So fitting isn't always the uh, answer of this uh, of solving this problem. Um, so they, what, what would be the in, impact of this uh, insufficient time resolution uh, when we like study this effect, the structural effect using Marcus theory? So for example, if you have, um, the lifetime plotted as function of delta G. One minute. In one, yes, in one circle, there are four different uh, plots, but they have all the same um, the uh, sample. So, for example, this one had was measured using faster setup uh, with fitting, but the other one is uh, measured using only using the slow setup and just determined by the graph. So it has fairly significant difference. So it uh, significantly affect the interpretation, interpretation of the data, where if you pick this plot, uh, this point and that, there is almost no dependence on delta G. However, if you pick this one, this is obviously faster than um, whatever measured using this methoxy substitute one. So the interpretation of data is totally different. So the conclusion is that insufficient time resolution may have significant uh, impact on determining the decay lifetime so interpretation, interpretation of the uh, molecular structure will be totally different. So you usually underestimate, but if you fit the uh, curve using stretch exponential model, then it might improve the result, but uh, when it doesn't follow the uh, stretch exponential behavior, the error might be even worse. So the most important, important thing is to resolve the initial plateau uh, precisely. So I'd like to thank uh, to like Attila, Peter, 
for this provision and power for supplying the materials and Andrew for uh, his help in the lab and all the colleagues in uh, ACC and IPRI. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. The difficult topic, very clearly explained. <laughs> thank you. Um, there's no questions in the chat and uh, there's too many people to see it so, um, with hands. So I'll start with a question, but just unmute yourself if you have a question. My question is simply, um, can you apply this sort of technique that you've talked about to any sort of metal center and ligand? I mean, obviously you mostly studied, studied cobalt or? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, this can be applied uh, with, I think, different materials, not only the cobalt, but also like one important, I think one interesting thing is to have um, like different metal centered cobalt complexes as a um, donor molecule. So you might have different reorganization energy so that charge transfer uh, probably gets faster. So this kind of effect is, I think, more critical if you have faster charge transfer. Right. So that's yeah. the decay rate, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much again. We'll move on. Um, our next speaker is the Anha, or Kevin as we call him, from uh, Deakin University. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Today I will talk. Sorry, I will talk about to the uh, my thesis to uh, finish with to the IC. This thesis into the side of carbon or air cathode for sodium oxygen battery using ionic liquid electrolyte. Um, my talk to to the five part. part. The first, please, I would like to introduce general information about to the sodium oxygen battery. Meta oxygen battery has to the interest uh, a lot research because you see there are many benefits. The first one, sodium oxygen battery has low high energy density in the compared to the lithium ion battery, and and sodium resources are abundant and cheaper, and also the overall potential is lower to the ox lithium oxygen battery. Moreover, the knowledge gained to the lithium oxygen battery can adapt to the sodium oxygen battery. However, there are many challenges into the sodium oxygen battery, like to the meta air battery, dendrite and corrosion into the main problem in the anode, uh, while to the decomposition of electrolyte in the other the issue. Moreover, the important problem comes from to the air cathode is located oxygen reduction reaction and passivation. So we can say it's the key reason how to the limit to the capacity and low, low cycling line. This my thesis will focus to the air cathode to fall to the sodium oxygen factory. Now uh, the first thing I would like to share with you about to the modified air um, cathode for sodium Oxygen battery due to the following three ionic limits binder. We select three polymer A to the binder for sodium oxygen battery. Two of them is to usually you for to the lithium ion battery and other meta air. And we introduce the new one, uh, fully with ionic liquid, fully to emphasize A to the new binder. I would like to highlight some key facts. Uh, fighting for to the my, uh, my research. The first one, the chemical nature of the binder impact to the battery performance, uh, especially capacity, columbic efficiency, and also to the fully ECMA, the FSI function binder can go more to the reduction of OCD gain in regarding to the capacity. Finally, the derivation of DVD uh, during battery operation. We found it to the sodium chloride and sodium carbonate to the side of the leading to the limit capacity. And other work, uh, I would like to share it to the formation mechanism of this drug order in sodium oxygen battery due to the ionic liquid. We knew to the um, electrolyte uh, pyrrhonium ionic liquid and combined with to the electropen carbon nanofiber supply by Professor Songjai. Um, this study has led to the different state of discharge capacity. 
we found it to the nuclear and nuclear growth site which show the COVID particle, however, with different size. And last time we found it to the increased size of the COVID and some um, thin fin. Um, so we, we can load that to the during battery performance, man which I am weekly with. Besides to the discharge loader, so in barrel superoxide generation, some side formation to the uh, air cathode, and that's the reason why it's the limit to the capacity and cooling distance in C. So next work, I work with to the collaborate with to the polymer to develop a new trajectory to improve battery performance. We use to the ion cell to protect to the uh, north, north side, and then this result so the limit to the uh, the thin film is in the side loader, and that's the reason why leading to the enhance to the capacity and collection efficiency. Um, finally, um, I work work to the enhance to the long time cycling. We use to the multi doping electron air cathode. Um, we use to the pan and polydecma exercise and to the cause recursor for synthesize to the nanofiber. And we found to the air cathode optimize in recent 30 percent polydecma exercise and very high to the multi doping percentage on song. This air cathode deliver the highest discharge capacity. Moreover, the sodium oxygen battery due to the uh, optimized air cathode and hydric electrolyte. Uh, so outstanding performance regarding long time cycling over 150 cycle. And I would like to notice this is the one to the highest in the literature regarding to the oxygen battery. So into the my thesis, I, I saw nothing. Uh, fully married ionic liquid can work as to the binder and recuser for air cathode fabricating during to the electrolyte process. And selected of binder very important because it can minimize battery fail and enhance to the long cycling. Moreover, ionic cell can prevent side the formation on the air cathode and enhance to the columbic efficiency. Finally, multi doping of the carbon fiber due to the air cathode can promote to oxygen reduction process. Virus to the thickness of air cathode can improve to reversibility oxidation reaction and air pollution. Finally, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Richina, Dr. Professor Batis, and my little group, Professor Maria, and collaborator. And and uh, many, many people in the my group. Um, thank you for your attention. I have to take your question. Thanks very much, Kevin. That was very clear. Thank you. Good to see a, a good example of some collaboration as well, which of course is such an important part of what we uh, do in ACES. So um, there is one uh, that might be too now. There's a question from uh, Gordon. So is gel protective layer the Iona gel? Given and if so, what's the mechanism of protection? Um, so, yes, mm -hmm. the, um, no, we use to the, as you can see, the same method. Um, no, the gel is protected to the anode, and during to the oxidation reaction, we went to the OC and to the some peroxide and gel. Uh, super dioxide generation affect to the anode and uh, causing to the side of the formation not only to the anode but also to the cathode. So we'll move on. Thank you very much again. Yes. Um, our next um, speaker is Luciana from the University of Wollongong. She's going to talk about some skin tissue engineering. But yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luciana, and today my talk will be about in vitro characterization of 3D printing platelet lysate by ink for potential application in skin tissue engineering. 
So the talk will be focusing on the work that I've done during my PhD, during the supervision of Professor Gordon Wallace, Dr. Zilin Yu, and Professor Danielle Skropeta. So without further ado, um, in all wounds besides superficial wounds, the capacity of the skin to self-repair is lost, and the mechanisms involved in the wound closure are unable to restore the skin original function. So in this context, the skin repair is achieved using surgical techniques, including um, skin grafts or skin equivalents. An ideal skin equivalent should provide an immediate coverage to the open wound and also support the subsequent functional and aesthetic regeneration. And although various skin equivalents have been developed for clinical use and significant advances has been made in the field of tissue engineering, uh, the complete replication of the cellular and structure and function of the skin um, remains a challenge. Um, also, increasing the aging population coupled with chronic conditions has been driven the demand for products with enhanced therapeutic outcomes. So having that in mind, the aim of the research was to develop a, function, a multifunctional 3D printed skin equivalent. And our hypothesis is that by combining 3D printing technology, functional biomaterials and relevant skin cells, we would be able to create a supportive network that mimics the native ECM for skin cells to migrate and thrive while uh, using the same platform as a delivery system to deliver cells and release growth factors to the uh, wound bed and to facilitate the wound process, the wound healing process, sorry. Um, so for the printing system, we use an extrusion-based bioprinting approach. And for the cell component, we started the characterization of the platform using fibroblast, which is the major component of the dermal layer. But each and every compartment of the skin requires different cells, and they, they do need to be redistributed in a specific manner. Um, so for the binding formulation, there are two main components, platelizate, which is responsible for the functional properties of the bioink, and gelma, which is responsible for the rheological and mechanical properties of the bioink. So platelizate is a byproduct obtained by the disruption of platelets, and it consists it is considered a cost-effective source of multiple growth factors. Uh, in our project, we used the commercial um, platelet pl pl um, uh, source, but in the future, uh, the same idea could be employed in an autologous context. So obtaining the platelet directly from patients to generate an autologous cathode for personalized therapy. So JAMA is, um, on the other hand, is a denatured type of collagen that has been um, used as a buying component widely, and it enables the appropriate filament deposition during the extrusion process and also provides the structural integrity after printing. So first, uh, the oscillatory and rotational rheology was performed to obtain an accurate analysis of the buying behavior and predict its printability. And overall, the buying formulation demonstrated a significant improvement in the rheological performance in comparison to the platelet itself. And these results indicated the buying meets the essential requirements for printability in terms of rheological properties. So for the post-printing characterization, um, physical and mechanical properties of the printed structure was studied to better mimic the native uh, skin tissue and also strengthen the cell attachment and cell proliferation. So the, the 3D printed construct demonstrated good printability and shape fidelity, which is demonstrated on figure A, um, also demonstrated good affinity, uh, affinity towards aqueous media and exhibited an improved uh, resistance towards uh, enzymatic de degradation in comparison to the control group. Also, the mechanical property demonstrated to be easily tuned to achieve stiffness that is equivalent to the native skin tissue by varying the JAMA concentration. Um, moving on to the growth factor release. So platelizate contains a large number of bioactive proteins, which uh, many of which have a fundamental role in the homeostasis and the tissue remodeling. And in this study, six uh, different uh, growth factors were used as an indicator of multiple factors and biologically relevant molecules present in the platelet So the cumulative release profile of those uh, growth factors in indicates that after two weeks of incubation, growth factors were still not exhausted from the printed constructs, showing that the potential of the platform to be used in a, as a long-term delivery 
delivery system for growth factors. So moving on to the biological characterization, um, the influence of the matrix in the viability, proliferation, morphology of the printed fibroblast was demonstrated in vitro. And here you can see the printed fibroblast show high viability over the period of uh, two weeks of culture and high confluence of the elongated shaped fibroblast subpopulation was observed after a week of culture, demonstrating that cells were attaching and thriving well in the matrix. So this was confirmed by F. actin staining, uh, which showed the change in cell skeleton uh, by assembly and reorganization of the act, uh, actin filaments from a random organized um, network at day one to a long parallel actin filaments at day seven to day 14. Um, in accordance to these findings, higher level of fibroblast proliferation uh, was also observed in the uh, printed fibroblast construct in figure D. Um, also, the degree of maturation of the dermis is normally verified by the content of ECM secreted by the fibroblast in the dermis region. So the ECM is a complex network consisting of structural proteins and other components arranged in a highly organized manner, distributed, um, contributing to the strength and structural integrity of the tissue. So here's some of the key uh, ECM components, <laughs> excuse me, were studied um, to demonstrate the effect of growth factors present in the platelized construct in supporting the deposition of the ECM by fibroblasts. So the fluorescent staining image uh, figure shows uh, the collagen type 1, collagen type 3, elastin, and fibronectin deposit, deposited by the fibro, uh, fibroblasts after 14 days of culture. And the PCI data and figure B uh, shows the buying support a high expression of collagen, especially collagen type 1 and collagen type 3 uh, in comparison to the control group. So growth factors present in the buying showed a positive impact in the synthesis of the ECM components by the human dermophobiblast culture after two weeks. Uh, so to increase the complexity of the bioprinted skin, and potentially improve the quality of the regenerated tissue, different structures of skin um, compartments uh, should be fabricated. Here are some of preliminary data of incorporation of other cells uh, to the established demo platform. Uh, so keratinocytes were seeded on the top of the demo layer to form an epidermal layer, and um, neurons were also added to the demo layer to form a pre innervated skin equivalent. And although preliminary results show potential to um, of the proposed by ink in supporting keratinocyte stratification and neural maturation, uh, more in-depth analysis in vitro and in vivo are needed to confirm these results and also to prove the therapeutic efficacy of the proposed platform in supporting new skin uh, tissue um, maturation and regeneration. So to summarize my talk, um, here, the composite, uh, we propose a composite of platelizate and um, geoma buying formulation um, to fabricate a multifunctional skin equivalent. And although uh, more in depth analysis is required to prove the ther uh, therapeutic efficacy in supporting skin regeneration, this, to this study laid the foundation um, of the fabrication of more complex and physiologically relevant platforms. So to finish up, I would like to thank my supervisors, collaborators at the ACES um, and the following research institutes. And uh, thank you all for hearing me today. Um, Simon says, does the scaffold modulus match that of native skin? Also, does skin modulus vary depending where on the body? Oh, yes. Uh, this, the modulus vary depending on, um, on the, this, uh, the, the place. Um, but we chose to work with the modulus that is 35 kilopascal, which was um, an average of the normal skin that was found in the literature. Okay, great. And, and Sepidar says, um, does the ink contain cells when you did the rheology tests on it? No, uh, we performed the rheology without cells. Okay, um, and does the shear from the printing have any effect on the cells? 
uh, we didn't notice any uh, effect on the cells because at day one, the cells were uh, had high viability. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, well done, great. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Chi Fang Chen, um, who, for, again from the University of Wollongong, who's going to talk about skin bioprinting using sulfated polysaccharide. Open. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Chi Fang, and my talk is titled Skin Bioprinting Using Sulfated Polysaccharide Oven. Uh, so oven is a broad name for the water-soluble polysaccharides exact, extracted from the cell wall of green seaweeds. Its sugar components may include alranos, dizylos, and uric acid, which are arranged in disaccharide repeating units. Uh, alranos is an unusual sugar unit known to interact with uh, human skin cells through the lactin sites on the cell membrane and the uric acid and sulfate groups render oven a structure analog to mammalian glycosaminoglycans glycans such as controlling sulfate and the dermatin sulfate. In addition, oven exhibits an array of biological properties such as antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and anticoagulant. These structure and biological properties make oven a strong candidate for application in skin tissue engineering However, so far, OVEN is un underexploited in this field. In this work, OVEN was first modified by misacrylation, and the product OMA is therefore photocross-linkable and enables the development of physiologically, physiologically stable structures. Then OVEN based, uh, bio -ink, serial bio-inks based on OMA were formulated in combination with JMA and gelatin at varied ratios. According to the, to the concentration of OMA in the bio-ink, these bio-inks were loaded as U0, U2, U4, and U6. Then cell laden structures containing human dermal fibroblasts were fabricated by 3D printing. Life death staining validated high cell viability for cells embedded in respective bio-inks. At day one post the printing, Structures printed with U4 and U6 uh, showed higher cell viability up to 97% in comparison to structures printed with U0 or U2. These bio-inks also supported cell proliferation as demonstrated by the increase in the metabolic activities over two weeks. The, bio the mechanical property of these bio-inks in their cross-linked form was examined examined as well, and results showed that the mechanical property increased with increasing the concentration of OMA in the bio-ink. Based on this mechanical property data, uh, we can see that the growth of the encapsulated cells uh, was negatively correlated with the mechanical property of the bio-inks, especially at the early time point. Among the four bio-inks, we can see that uh, Cell laden structures printed with bio ink U2 of a moderate mechanical property supported beta cell proliferation. Since there was significant cell proliferation, we then looked into the expression and the production of uh, these uh, of the major extracellular matrix proteins. So this is gene expression analysis by real time PCR, and it shows that. The inclusion of OMA in the bio ink did not induce significant change in the expression of collagen 1, elastin, and fibronectin, but a significant down regulation effect on collagen 3 gene was noted for structures printed with U2, U4, or U6 in comparison with those printed with U0. The deposition of these extra cellular matrix proteins was confirmed in the meantime, following two weeks in vitro culture indicating the potential of our printed cell laden structures to develop and establish dermal-like properties. Then a full sickly skin model was constructed by culturing the high-cut keratinocytes on top of the 3D printed dermal-like structures based on bio in U2. And the high-cut cells were allowed to differentiate as the air, air liquid interface for up to 28 days. And uh, here shows the, and the, and the histology study shows that, uh, showed that the high cells were successfully stratified 
So historical studies showed that uh, Hakka cells successfully stratified as evidenced by the increase in the epidermal, in the thickness of the epidermal layer and the distinct uh, orientation of the cell nuclei. And here shows the top view and the microscopic side view of the printed skin construct. And uh, the immunostaining of the cross section showed two distinct cellular layers. So here on the top layer, the Hakka cells formed a densely packed uh, epidermal layer, whereas in as a bottom layer, bottom dermal layer, the 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 cells has the at the bottom layer, the cells has very different distribution in the pores and within the gel. So oh, sorry. So the pores introduced by 3D printing showed uh, showed elongated dermal fibroblasts. But with inside the cell, inside the gel, the cells were sparse and uh, many in rounded shape. More collagen one was also uh, observed to be deposited in the pores as well. Um, as well, and uh, these results highlight the supportive role of three D printing in in fabricating the artificial skin. Human epidermis undergo differentiation hierarchically from the, dermal la from the bottom layer towards the surface, and which is characterized by the expression of characteristic protein markers. Here, skin constructs based on bioing U2 were examined for the protein markers of KX67, indicating the cell proliferation, keratin 10 indicating, in, indicating the early stage differentiation, loricrine and evolucrine indicating terminal differentiation. And the results showed normal expression of KX67 and keratin 10 and loricrine, but a disordered expression of evolucrine. Even though the present skin model had limitations, this is promising for progression towards the development of all van based skin constructs with barrier functions. In the future, more work is required to um, develop skin constructs with, with fully functional traits that might be useful in clinic. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Well done for persevering despite your distractions, the challenge of working at home. So um, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions in the chat, but um, we will move on because I think we have some technical things to get over um, <laughs> before our next presentation. So Sam, do we have, um, I believe we're going to have a pre-recorded talk. We use the terms justice and resilience a lot, but might not reflect on them just as much. So my goal with this presentation is to invite your reflections on what you understand a just and resilient zero carbon world to look like and whether this vision fits our motivations of why we are working on cutting edge technology and social innovations. It's only just over a couple of weeks ago that the COP26 climate summit finished where parties agreed on phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and phasing down unabated coal power in the Glasgow Climate Pact. And while we know that much more would have needed to be committed to really keep 1.5 degrees global warming securely within reach, the pressure is now on to ensure decision makers and those working behind the scenes, including us as researchers, actively seek to maximize the core benefits of mitigation and adaptation measures with the aim of overcoming the interconnected planetary imbalances and social injustices we're facing. Technological innovation plays its important part, but won't get us to a zero carbon future single-handedly, let alone one that is just. So key learnings from transition research highlight over and over again, the critical importance that in order to realize the huge economic employment, health and environmental opportunities and benefits of transitioning to a zero carbon economy requires deliberate policy choices and engaging respectfully and in an inclusive manner with affected workers and the broader communities that currently too often do not benefit from energy infrastructures in their regions, whether that be old fossil fuel based or large scale renewables installations. Profits tend to flow out of the regions and into the hands of foreign owned companies shareholders. So 
A key part of the challenge is to transition rapidly to a re renewable energy powered future that is inclusive, informed by local knowledge and experience, and that actually expands opportunities for all workers and community members, especially those previously marginalized groups. What we're seeing at the system level is, of course, the grand transformation away from centralized fossil fuels towards decentralized renewables. And in Australia, we've just seen a quarter of records with almost 1,200 megawatts of new wind, solar and battery capacity entering the market between July and September. So the transition of the national electricity market is well underway. But the key question, in my view, that remains is whether the active participation of end users in an optimized renewable energy system will be truly transformative or whether we are merely replacing technologies and infrastructures without addressing the asymmetries relating to the ownership and governance of assets that ultimately determine who the main beneficiaries are going to be and whether the co-benefits of climate change mitigation and adaptation measures are indeed maximized. And the example of community batteries illustrates this quite nicely. Now they're going to play a major role in Australia's or they're likely to play a major role in Australia's energy transition as they can smooth out issues relating to the system integration of renewables, both in terms of locating batteries at the end of transmission lines in the existing electricity grid to avoid curtailment and create a supply buffer, as well as in terms of moving towards a more localized system, so comprising of energy resilient islandable microgrids that can be especially important in emergency prone areas. So in Victoria, for example, research has found that the crisis experience of the terrible 2019-2020 bushfires has increased communities' desire to secure a self-sufficient energy source significantly. And the Australian Energy Regulator just released its new electricity distribution ring fencing guideline designed to establish a competitive neighborhood battery market. Uh, it's intending to do that by giving distribution network service providers such as City Power in Melbourne or Osnet Services in Eastern Victoria greater scope to participate uh, in the provision of community scale batteries or standalone power systems. Now I've spoken about the importance of discourses many times before, but uh, while we use the terms community batteries and neighborhood batteries, uh, implying that such batteries are scaled to, look, uh, to meet local needs. Questions about the ownership, control and the benefit are yet to be really fully scrutinized and articulated. So to date, even though we say neighborhood and community batteries, they have been 100% owned, well, most of them have been 100% owned and controlled by DNSPs. So these types of batteries should be referred to really as distributed batteries to better reflect their ownership and governance currently. And I'd argue that the term community batteries should rather be reserved for batteries that include members of a local community in the actual ownership and or governance of the asset. And I reckon this uh, distinction is very important because it does create space for community focused models and hybrid models where locals could co-invest in battery um, in a battery that then will be operated by a DNSP for example. Now to keep the privately owned DNSPs in check the regulator says it will put a cap on the revenue that they can earn from the new services but I think it's fair to say that it will be incumbent regime actors that are out to profit and benefit from the provision of so-called community batteries. Therefore, I think the mislabeled uh, distributor batteries may result in actually insufficiently engaging with local communities and thereby limiting the potential to contribute more directly to local economies and community resilience and the broader zero carbon transition. Now, this of course is not to diminish that the new guideline is actually expected to provide a level playing field for energy storage devices, which of course is a huge opportunity and needed to accelerate the zero carbon transition. But I think to maximize the core benefits and realize the potential to enable community leadership, we need regulation that explicitly addresses community benefit through, for example, enabling ownership and co-investment, greater transparency and uh, decision-making power. 
So by working with local skills and trades, these batteries can deliver more than a market and network service. They can actually strengthen local economies and enhance climate resilience, particularly of at-risk communities. And this is not just an airy-fairy idea, but there's demand for alternatives and community-focused models. So we see widespread skepticism, for example, about the capacity of the energy industry and energy regulators to work in end users' long-term interest, with less than half of the respondents saying that they were confident this was the case in the latest energy consumers sentiment survey from June 2021. And there's growing opposition to transmission line expansion corridors, like here displayed in Eastern Victoria, and the announced uh, acquisition of PowerShop by the oil and gas giant Shell, uh, for example, triggered thousands of PowerShop users to look for alternatives. There is a desire for change as well as a huge market potential for a whole range of community based and community focused energy services, which I don't have time to explain all in detail, but I'd encourage you to follow those hyperlinks I've included here to get some great uh, resources discussing the nitty gritty of local energy markets, open source digital services, load shifting, etc. Now to conclude, coming back to the concept of empowerment. I'd argue that we must think beyond capacity building towards actually positioning end users to meet their energy needs and goals whilst fostering an ecological understanding that the earth is finite. We need technological innovation, yes, but our solutions need to be compatible with planetary boundaries. So if we simply strive to replace our fossil fuel work with electrification, we are bound to lock in the interconnected planetary imbalances and social injustices we are facing today. So I reckon we need deliberate policy choices which ought to be backed by research that does not compartmentalize but rather seeks to maximize the core benefits of mitigation and adaptation measures. And let's finish up on some good news, I suppose. The Australian energy regulator is establishing a regulatory sandboxing function that aims to help energy innovators and startups navigate the regulatory frameworks and also enable the trial of new products and services. This could be a real opportunity to trial new concepts, for example, co-design research projects that really prioritize community benefit and active end user participation from the onset rather than as an afterthought. So strategic partnerships with critical industries are of course important and one part, but we need partnerships beyond big business, which is losing its social license to operate as the key incumbents of the old system. And with that, I'd just like to thank you, look forward to your questions and feedback, and would also like to thank my supervisor, Professor Linda Hancock. Thanks. I don't have any questions at the moment, Linda. Um... Linda is online if anybody wants to ask a question of her. All right. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just let you go and sort out your your technical problems. Thanks very much for recording a, a presentation. That's that's a very showed great foresight. So very good. Um, look, thank you to everyone for speakers from today. I think uh, absolutely there's a message in the, in the chat from Gordon, really just saying thank you very much to everyone for a fantastic set of presentations and and. Um, I don't know, Gordon, do you want to speak to that since you, you're still here? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Jenny. Uh, look, thank you to all the presenters. It really did reinforce what we all know is uh, the, the, the greatest legacy, I think, of ESSES, and that's what we've, we've all learned together uh, from the, the youngest researchers to the oldest researchers. We, we've learned together how to do research better, I think, and to position it better. Uh, and I think you've heard that from all of our speakers in both sessions today. Uh, it certainly came through, if not uh, directly, and it's obvious that they've acquired the skills to be able to do that and to, to build into taking that ACES knowledge and, and methods and methodology and, and applying it to bigger challenges uh, and great challenges as we go forward. So it's been, been exciting and I think tomorrow will be equally exciting. So thanks, Jenny. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, see you tomorrow.